Well, Johnny, you at work or at home? I'm at work. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Uh, Hello. We're getting a, an adapter made for a nice CCD, so I'm hoping it's done by one o'clock. Oh, okay. Of course, you're delivering all your lectures now by Zoom. Yeah, we do the lectures by Zoom. We're doing the labs face to face. Yeah. With uh, bubbles and masks and social distancing and all of that. Mm. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, so is there, so you're blocked by Zoom or do you know? So, so there. It seems we have a technical issue, and one of the speakers from China cannot enter it. Jian, Jian Wu. Uh, Kyoshi, if you, if, if you send the link, the email that you got directly, Jian Wu, it, it should work. No, no, no. They, I think they, they received it. It's, it's, it's I don't know. I, I also joined the Zoom meeting now. I can see you, Kyoshi, on the screen. And I cannot see myself. <laughs> Oh. Oh, you, you can, oh, I can see you now. Yeah. He can he can see all of us, but he cannot somehow find himself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it means I cannot share my screen and I cannot uh, activate my camera. Or yeah. Can you can can oh, who can help? Who can right. help? Yeah. Uh, let 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 me talk to some of the technical persons here. Yes, Ravi. Ravi Mohanapriya or uh, Devi Prashanti or Srikant, who is? Uh, yes, who is, I'm here. I'm here, sir. I'm here. Ravi. Uh, uh, Ravi. Ravi, yes, uh, can you please help uh, Professor Jian Wu? He's speaker yes. number thirty-six. The okay. fifth. Yeah, so the fifth speaker can, today. He can, he can see all of us, but he cannot see himself. That means he cannot share the screen. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, I'll I'll send a separate uh, Zoom link for testing. Yeah, do, do he's, you, you... He's, not, he's not the first speaker, but could you please please prepare it? <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Ravi should be able to uh, help him out. Uh, Ravi he belongs to our technical support team, and uh, he should be able to help him out. Ravi, okay. do you have uh, do you have Professor Jian Wu's email address and contact details? I'll take it from the list, sir. We have okay, list. good, 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 good. Yeah. Uh, he's the fifth speaker today, speaker okay, number thirty-six. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes. All right. I hope I hope it works. Good yeah. evening, everybody. Good morning, Steve. Okay. Okay. Oh, hi. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So, Steve, have you noticed the connect connections of this section? They are all speakers. And you know, you know Joachim very well, right? And he was an international chair 10 years ago. And the second speaker, Kenichi Ishikawa, is going to host Ikupik in 2025 or 27. And 25, I would say. <laughs> 25? <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> and okay. the last speaker, Mikhail Maya, is going to host ICPIC in 2025. He believes maybe 27. We will see. <laughs> and eventually, we should go to China. So, Steve, we have to, you have to stay for more than 10 years to go to China together. Your, your microphone is off. Yes, yeah, Steve, your microphone is off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, most people prefer it that way. 
of course, of course, all the all the speakers were well, somehow affected by your science. I mean, you do so many things in our community, so everybody somehow is connected in science. But but the point, yes. point for me is that they are all ikupikas. <laughs> right, 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 mm -hmm. and. Big Peak is the is the meeting that I've been going to longest, the international meeting. The first one I went to was in 1969. It was in uh, wow. at MIT. Wow. <laughs> it's nine o'clock in Japan. Shall we start? Yeah, I think so. Um, it is time. Uh, so let me invite everybody for today's session. This is session number five of this conference, Advances in Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Sciences. It's a great celebration of uh, Steve's contributions to the field for more than half a century, and also a personal landmark on completing his 80th. Um, today's session is on... Uh, uh, atomic and molecular physics with uh, lasers. And uh, we have Professor Kiyoshi Ueda to chair this session. And Professor John Costello would co-chair. Professor Ueda is very well known for his work on electron molecular dynamics using novel light sources, short pulse optical lasers, synchrotron, free electron laser, and um, his work in quantum interference, entanglement, molecular imaging is well known. Uh, Professor uh, Costello's work on uh, extreme ultraviolet, soft X-ray imaging, spectroscopy, uh, free electron lasers is also well known. And we had him with us to chair the session yesterday. So let me invite uh, Professor Kiyoshi Ueda to take over and conduct the session. Thank you, Koeshi. Hello, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good morning, everybody. And good <laughs> afternoon, everybody. <laughs> and, and as, I, as I said, you will see most of the brilliant Ikupikas today. And the first mm -hmm. speaker is Mr. Ikupik, Joachim Budofa. And he's going to talk about Atoskan chronoscopy from simple atoms to complex system. This is a sort of connection extensions from Anatoly's session. We are going to hear more about Atoskan science. Joachim, please. Okay, well, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak about this topic. And I hope, Kiyoshi, by the end of my talk, you can pronounce the name, the title of my talk, <laughs> Chronoscopy. So I will, I, will re, I will repeat it a few times so that by the time we are the, arriving at the conclusions, uh, it might be okay. So and now I will try to get my screen uh, shared on this. You just picked it to make it difficult. Okay, okay. So. Can you see it? Yes. Very good. So I would like to talk about attosecond chronoscopy, and I would like to go from simple atoms or supposedly simple atoms to more complex systems. And I would like in, uh, on, on this, uh, in a very short outline to explain uh, what can be learned in a sense that is complementary to what traditionally atomic or spectroscopy uh, information can provide uh, that looking at the time axis provides to some extent complementary information. And as we go from simple systems to more complex systems, certainly the possibility to look into the time resolved dynamics gets of uh, considerable intrinsic interest as one can address questions like dissipation, relaxation, or processes that essentially have a specific arrow of time that are not uh, reversible. So that's what I would like to uh, briefly talk about. And let me uh, start out before I forget it. 
let me first acknowledge all the some of the collaborators uh, contributing to this work uh, on the side of the atomic systems. Um, this is in particular Stefan Donza, Iva Brezinova, Renate Prasorek, and Stefan Nagle. And for the nanostructures I will be talking about, this is primarily the work of Georg Wachter and sur sur surfaces I will get to that is primarily Christoph Lemaire's work. Hmm. We have lots of collaborations with foreign colleagues, in particular on the experimental side with the people in Garching. Uh, and uh, in addition, we have also fruitful collaboration with a lot of theorists who have contributed to this part of the work. And I want to mention in particular, Luca Argenti and Jean Minton. Let me give you a brief outline of what I would like to uh, cover until Kiyoshi will cut me off. I will start out with uh, the basics of scattering phases and time delays for simple atoms. I will then uh, switch briefly to time uh, delays in nanostructures. And then we will go on to surfaces and looking at time results for the emission from surfaces. And at the very end, I want to briefly mention now various proposals to measure scattering phases directly. And I will come back to that in a moment. So the starting point of the modern uh, view of attosecond chronoscopy was it's set with the search for the quest for time zero of the process of photoionization. So sch schematically, uh, XUV photon comes in, shoots out an electron, ionizes it. And now we ask the question, what is actually the time zero of this process? So in other words, on what time scales are is the wave packet formed that actually finally uh, disappears at infinity. This is a half scattering processes, photon in, electron out. And when one looks a little closer, the time shift, that is the time it takes to form the wave packet relative to the incidence of the XUV photon, that is what's then asked, what's the time zero is, is actually given by the spectral derivative of the ionization phase, and the ionization phase is also related to the scattering phase. And that goes back to the work of Eisenwood, Wigner, and Smith in the 50s of the last century. Now, let's look at this picture, which actually shows up in the advertisement of the conference. Up there, you find a paper by Steve Manson. It's now 51 years old. And the title of this paper is Dependence of Phase Shifts on Energy. And as you may have just seen in the previous transparency, I was looking at the spectral derivative of the energy. So the energy of the phase, so the energy dependence of the phase is precisely what on the in differential level determines the timing process uh, of the photo emission event. So there is a very close connection between what Steve was already working on and thinking about 51 years ago and what's nowadays uh, discussed uh, and experimentally and theoretically investigated. Now, the timing measurements of photoionization uses two different techniques, which I just briefly want to mention. One technique uses streaking where the interaction between the electron and the, out, uh, the outgoing electron and an IR field is essentially a classic ponderomotive shift of energy and momentum giving rise to these uh, typical oscillatory patterns around the nominal uh, electron of the en energy of the emitted electron. And the timing of this oscillation, that is the phase gives us information of when the electron actually has entered the continuum. And that's then usually called the streaking time, which contains these Eisenwood, Wigner, Smith time as one piece. And another piece is the so-called Coulomb laser coupling to which I will come later. There's an alternative technique called rabbit, which now uses rather than a classical picture of the ponderomotive momentum shift uses actually quantum interference that there are two pathways to get to a certain uh, energy called the sideband that you take the high harmonic uh, uh, peak 
which is above or the high harmonic peak, which is below, and you absorb or emit an additional IR photon, getting energetically to the same uh, part of the spectrum. And therefore in principle, there are two interfering paths, which then can be used to get the phase difference between the upper and the lower uh, um, electron emission peak resulting from the high harmonic. So in other words, one can measure the energy change of the ionization phase uh, for the difference between these two peaks. And that is an approximation to the uh, derivative of the scattering phase. And these two techniques have been used. And also when simulation and uh, experiment are compared, uh, this is sort of the observable that one looks at. So let's come start with the uh, experiment that actually opened up this field about 10 years ago, the ionization of neon from either the 2S or the 2P state uh, and measuring the electron energy of the emitted electron as a function of the delay between the pump that is the XUV pulse that does the ionization and the IR field that does the streaking that does this timing. And you see this typical oscillatory pattern from the classical Ponderomodi momentum or energy shift. But if you look very close, these two tr oscillatory trains are actually slightly displaced to another. And from this displacement, from the time shift, one can actually extract the so-called streaking time. And from the streaking time, one can actually extract the eisenbutt wigner smith uh, delay time. And uh, at the time, uh, the first uh, measurement uh, gave uh, about 20 attoseconds. So this was the first clear evidence that this process or more precisely these differences occur on the uh, few attosecond scale. Uh, and at that time, the number was estimated to be 20. Fast forward. Meanwhile, there are lots of ab initio calculations around for this process. Uh, and moreover, there are more recent uh, data available. And uh, the overall trend was confirmed. The important point to be noted is the slow electron, that is the electron coming from the 2S shell, is actually faster in the formation of the wave packet than the 2P. But the difference was not, is not like 20 attoseconds, but more at this energy like 10 attoseconds. Uh, it turned out that uh, in the experiment, there is an overlap with shakeup uh, states and that sort of has to be taken into account. And meanwhile, the Lund, Lund group has used rabbit rather than streaking but because of better energy, energy resolution, uh, the uh, uh, shakeup contribution can be uh, isolated and uh, taken out. Uh, then meanwhile, the various theoretical calculations and the experiments agree very well so at least for simple atoms, this photo ionization time delay seems to be uh, reasonably uh, well understood. There is now an interesting development very recently. When one looks at the measuring process that is on either rabbit or streaking, uh, this correction, as I was pointing out before, has to be taken into account. But very recently, there has been the increasing insight that this process, which initially was thought just an experimental tool to observe the eisenboot wigner smith time delay for the transition to the continuum, actually contains itself additional physics information. If you think in terms of this diagram, which pertains to rabbit, there is an additional transition to this uh, sideband state. And for this process here, there can be a time delay just as there is a time delay from bound to continuum transition. So we are talking about continuum, continuum time delays. So that is in fact the time delay for either bremsstrahlung or inverse bremsstrahlung. And now it has also been possible to measure this time delay hmm, and also doing uh, calculations. Uh, in this case, the calculation done is for helium. Hmm. And one sees now that because the S and the D state of the same energy contribute to a angular distribution, the corresponding anisotropy parameter shows characteristic rabbit-like oscillations. From the rabbit-like oscillations, one can extract the phase or more precisely the phase difference and the difference between the spectral derivatives from the 
upper and the lower state. And as a result of this, one can get now a directly time delay information uh, for the formation of the S-like and the D-like wave packet as a result of these transitions, these continuum continuum transitions. So the idea to measure eisenwood wigner smith delays for bound-free transitions has now been complemented by the concept of measuring free-free transitions and looking at the time delay uh, for that process. And it turns out what was called the continuum continuum coupling or likewise Coulomb laser coupling is nothing but measuring this additional time delay uh, uh, which occurs in a continuum continuum transition. So far the story for simple atoms. Let's now look at nanostructures. And the favorite case there is in the endohedral fullerenes. As it turns out, it was actually Steve Manson and collaborators or in the early 2000s pointing out that if one looks at these endohedral uh, uh, fullerenes, that is an atom encapsulated in such a um, buckyball, uh, uh, the photoionization uh, will be influenced. That is the photoionization cross-sections will be modulated. In fact, a much earlier uh, concept like this was XFs in solid state physics, uh, where people realized that uh, the neighborhood around an atom uh, inside the bulk is influenced by the lattice atoms nearby when the uh, photoionization happens near threshold. And now meanwhile, for the fullerenes, uh, uh, Steve Manson and collaborators provided calculations for the modulation of the photoionization cross-section. And the idea is that as the electron runs out, it runs through the shell of carbon atoms. Uh, this potential allows then to back reflect the electron and coming out later. So you get a so-called confinement resonance and this confinement resonance will modulate the uh, corresponding uh, photoionization cross section. And the very first experimental verification that this uh, is happening is shown here. And meanwhile, there are a lot more and more, uh, uh, let's say statistically more significant data available that the structure is clearly visible. Certainly this, stimulated the idea that this process here looked here in a, on a in a spectral domain also should be visible in the time domain. So some years ago, we looked at the time delay for endohedral full, fullerenes. And we, in this case, we certainly used a helium simpler system. And the question was, first of all, what kind of a potential should one use and what effects will we see? And we first look at the eisenwood wigner smith delay hmm, uh, for model potential for the uh, uh, buckyball shell at different levels of sophistication. And what you see here is the time delay as a function of the photon energy. And you see for the simple uh, shell potential, very pronounced oscillations as a function of the energy, which are a direct manifestation of these confinement resonance effects. If you take a somewhat more smooth, that is also a somewhat more realistic potential distribution. These oscillations get kind of smoothed out, but you still clearly see traces of these structural still present. The question would there be now, what about measuring this? As I discussed before, measuring this requires a streaking field or a rabbit uh, IR field. And you now for- him. Yes. Two, him two more minutes. Two okay. more minutes. Okay, fine. Okay. So then uh, the streaking field for uh, such a endohedral foreign certainly produces now a lot of interesting physics, which goes well beyond what we have seen for simple atoms. So this is a TDDFT calculation for the uh, near field enhancement uh, near a uh, buckyball. You see the carbon atoms here. Huh? As a result of this is the electron as it leaves the buckyball is subject to this IR field, which is now strongly modified by the collective response of this uh, uh, many body system. And as a result of this, uh, that also the information on in terms of time delays and streaking gets new and additional features. And I just want to show you this as an example. So this is the time shift 
but now we are looking at different contributions. One is the electron as it takes off from the central atom first has to reach the uh, edge of the uh, buckyball surface. And during that time, there is no IR field because the IR field is near perfectly screened. So there is a transport time delay, which is unrelated to the atomic EWS time delay shown here. In addition, when the electron finally passes through the carbon shell, it sees a, a strongly collectively enhanced electric field, which accelerates the electron, which produces an apparent negative time delay. And if you add them all together, you get a sum of time delays, which is near but not uh, equal to the EWS time delay. And even there, the sum of the oscillatory structures still survive. So here we see that the information of timing provides additional information on different type of processes uh, showing effects of the collective response of screening of near field enhancement information that is well beyond what uh, the simple EWS delay uh, would get. So since um, the chairman already tells me that I better should quit. So I will not tell you the story about surfaces. That would be an even more complex system uh, to look at. Let me just make a final remark about the direct access to sc uh, scattering phases. So far, I talked about the spectral derivative. Now there are two proposals, or at least two proposals around for measuring ionization phases directly without looking at the spectral derivative. One which we have proposed uh, last year where we used uh, the, the availability of circularly polarized high harmonics, which allows polarization tagging and allows, allows to have two quantum paths to the same final state, which then allows to do, subtract a smooth background phase, a holographic background phase from a rapidly varying phase and allowing directly measuring phases and we have shown that one can rep accurately reproduce this way uh, a Fano sc uh, scattering phase near a Fano resonance. And there's an alternative interesting uh, result uh, for free electron lasers where one two photon uh, ionization uh, interferences are looked at by the group to which our, uh, the chairman of the session belongs, uh, where also selective information on as scattering phases or ionization phases were directly uh, extracted. So, and with this, I would like to start to say, to stop with a summary and outlook. And I think at this op uh, occasion, I think the best outlook uh, we should have is we wish Steve many more years of fun and physics. Uh, we enjoyed his presence at not only ICPIX, but meetings <laughs> in general. And we hope we will see you at many more ICPIX to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Any questions? If not, it's already time is up. Can I move to the second speaker? Kenichi Ishikawa? Yes. I will share my screen. Anyway, whoever yes. who has a question, could you please send the question through the chat? That makes us easier. Yes, please. Kenichi. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so yes, uh, let me uh, yes uh, let me start. So uh, first of all, uh, I, I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, actually, this is it's my great honor to give a small talk at this uh, symposium to celebrate the rich contribution of Professor Steve Manson. So uh, and also I put what, what did I do? So I explicitly put uh, in my title at the seconds and dipole. So this is to make a contrast to that of my next next speaker, uh, Reinhardt. Okay, and 
uh, as Joachim already uh, explained much, uh, uh, Steve Manson, so Professor uh, Steve Manson had greatly contributed the discuss uh, discussion of uh, photo emission delay. And in the original work uh, 10 years ago, so the original experiment by Schultz and co-workers 10 years ago, uh, this was uh, the time delay between the electrons, photoelectrons from 2P and 2S per neon. Actually, they are from different shells, so they have different kinetic energies. So regardless of its uh, photo emission delay, Actually, this electrons reaches a detector uh, much earlier anyway. The, in this work, uh, I want to uh, talk about a delay uh, of uh, from the same shells. So, okay, delay between uh, the elect photo electron from the same shells uh, with the same kinetic energies resulting from a single photon ionization and two photon ionization of neon to be subject. And in this case, the delay at the detector should be the same as the uh, emission delay. And this uh, setup can be experimentally, experimentally realized by free electron laser Fermi, uh, in which omega to omega coherent control experiment uh, was done. So this is the uh, uh, setup of the filmy. So because I am the reticent, I don't know much about the setup and actually our chairman uh, knows much better. But anyway, this uh, filmy can produce uh, this kind of temporary coherent bichromatic field uh, with omega and its second harmonic uh, with uh, given relative uh, phase delay between the fundamental and the second harmonic component. And uh, in this case, so from the, uh, in the case of the ionization from neon to P shells, there are uh, maybe five possible uh, ionization paths uh, to the final uh, photoelectron uh, continuum state. And in the experiment, uh, they or well, we have uh, tried three different fundamental frequency uh, with three different uh, photoelectron kinetic energies and measured uh, photoelectron angular distribution, uh, photoelectron angular distribution as a function of omega to omega delay. Indeed, I participated in the experiment, so here is our chairman and some collaborators here, and I, I so as a theoretician, I enjoyed very much the experimental uh, experiments and beam time, and also uh, pizza, of course. And then our part, uh, we have also done a real time uh, ab initial uh, computation based on the time dependent shredding equation. Uh, the process uh, can be uh, uh, expressed or described by the time dependent shredding equation with this uh, Hamiltonian, so including electron atom Coulomb uh, interaction. And here we have used uh, electric dipole approximation uh, in the velocity gauge. Okay, and we assume that electric field is uh, parallel to the z axis. And we have uh, simulated, uh, Numega simulated uh, this time dependent shredding equation using the so called time dependent complete active space self consistent field method uh, developed, developed by our group, our own group, and especially uh, uh, with the greatest contribution from uh, uh, Takeshi Sato. And in this approach, we expand the uh, total electron wave function in terms of different uh, electronic uh, configuration using orbital functions. And the main point is uh, orbital functions are time dependent, uh, which lead to better description of excitation and ionization. And the expressions motion for CI coefficients and orbital functions are derived uh, on the basis of the time-dependent variation of principles. 
and to reduce the computational uh, cost, uh, we freeze one uh, S electrons of neon, and uh, we move two uh, S to P electrons uh, in time with free correlated mono. And and we have implemented, especially our uh, former PhD student and now postdoc uh, Yuki implemented infinite range exterior complex scaling as an efficient uh, absorbing boundary and TSA method for calculating the photoelectron angular distribution. And here is a result, uh, example of the results. So comparison between experiments and uh, simulations. Here is, uh, okay, we expressed the photoelectric angular distribution or PAT uh, using the, this uh, formula, using the uh, genre polynomials and beta parameters as is customly in this field. And here I plot beta one and beta three as a function of a relative phase between fundamental and its second harmonic. And then a solid line, uh, I think, uh, which is which? Oh, okay. Uh, they are, I think they are. Uh, anyway, uh, we have a uh, very good, excellent argument between theory, actually, theory solid lines, I think solid line theory and dotted line as measurement or something like that. And as you can see, we have excellent agreement. But I must admit that we have scaled theoretical value by 50%, but uh, we get that it is due to experimental uncertainty uh, of uh, intensity ratio. And uh, because we can scale uh, both uh, beta one and beta three with the same factor. Now, so let discuss uh, more about pho photoelectron angular distribution. So uh, sufficiently far from uh, the nucleus, uh, we have a photoelectron wave packet, uh, something like this. So this is uh, resulting from uh, two photonization and this uh, result from single photonization. And here is a relative phase. And uh, this wave packet has a photoelectron angular distribution given by this formula. And uh, only the third term, this interfering term, uh, has a uh, phi dependence. And then this can be reduced or rewritten in this form. So this is, and this can be viewed as an angle resolved phase difference uh, between single and two photon ionization. And if we have multiple magnetic quantum numbers, so if we have uh, multiple incoherent uh, wave packet, we can add up uh, in, uh, with respect to M and we can have some vectorial average or some weighted average of uh, this angle result phase difference between single and two photon ionization. And, uh, here we plot this angular uh, result phase difference between single and two photonization uh, for three different uh, phot uh, photon energies and photoelectron kinetic energies. Uh, this is a phase shift difference. So this is a phase uh, difference between single and two photon ionization as a function of emission angle. And solid line, this solid line is our simulation result and uh, circles uh, measurement. Uh, again, as you can see, this is here, we can see excellent agreement between theory and measurement. And because this is, because this is the uh, difference of the phase uh, between single photon ionization or oh, two photon ionization, single photon ionization. Uh, if we uh, take a derivative of the phase with respect to photon energy, uh, we can get 
some kind of photo emission delay uh, as a function of uh, polar angle. So we call this generalized delay of two photon ionization relative uh, to one photon ionization. And okay, finally, uh, I discuss, let's uh, discuss briefly a connection to uh, Wigner Smith's Eisenberg delay. And okay, so first uh, to simplify the discussion, let's consider ionization from S So uh, something like that. So and then angular distribution is given by this. So S wave, B wave, and D, D wave. And uh, again, this can be written in this form with angle result phase difference between single photon and two photon analysis. And then uh, we can see that actually this phase difference is a kind of some, some weighted average of dp difference and sp difference or dp in interference and sp interference and if we take a derivative with respect to photon energy we can uh, get a group delay of two photon ionization wave pocket relative to one photon and okay this is a kind of equivalent to the phase information, but uh, this quantity is sensitive to the photoelectron ionization dynamics, especially when uh, this ratio, so the ratio of this and this rapidly changes, for example, near the resonance. So even if the Wigner delays of each waves are small individual. And in the present, uh, experiment, we have ionization p uh, from p so you know, to p. So the situation is uh, slightly more complicated because we need incoherently add the contribution from three different magnetic quantum number. So in this case, uh, also the, uh, the phase is inco incoherently weighted average or angle resolved weight differences in each m and uh, I have to admit that the, uh, the physical significance of this derivative is more uh, subtle and that's why we call it generalized delay. So in summary, so we have demonstrated a new method to measure angle result scattering phases in photo emission. And this, and we can extract angle result phase difference and maybe generate delay between single and two photon ionization wave packets. And both wave packets have the same kinetic energy in contrast to streaking or rabbit experiments. And again, in contrast to streaking rabbit experiments, we don't need any, um, any additional IR pulse, which makes uh, discussion more complicated. And as an outlook, uh, maybe we want to some experiments using the Escher ionizations, or we and also we can extend the same discussion to molecules uh, we hold. And in the end, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, especially the former PhD student of Kyoshi, chairman, and many other experimental and theoretical groups and our funding engines. And thank you for your attention and especially Steve. Thank you, Kenichi. And any questions? And could you please, everybody, could you please look at chat? There are quite interesting discussion going on and one question mm -hmm. came from Jobin Jose and <laughs> kindly Ravi answered to him that KH is <laughs> explaining everything. <laughs> just a moment, just a moment. Uh, what kind of, uh, the, uh, which questions? Uh, the, where shall I look up? 
Yes, or I look. Uh, this must be chat in chat. Okay. Yes. So anyway, yeah. is there any questions? Again, time is running. So someone asked the question and it's already answered, maybe? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think my question. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, John is the one who asked the question and Ravi answered to it. And, and everybody, whenever you have a question, could you please just write down the question to the chat and someone will answer to you. And look, please read those, these discussions. And that's very interesting. And shall we go to the next speaker? But before going to from at second to zept second, we are going to go to cold atoms. And the speaker is a former student of Steve or a postdoc student. And anyway, Arijit is going to talk about towers development of cold atom ion quantum networks. And this is another interesting subject that we want to cover in ICPIC once again. Ajit? Yeah, yeah thank you, Please Professor Kyoshi. Ahead. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, I hope it is visible to all. Yes. OK, uh, so uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Towards the Development of uh, Cold Atom Ion Quantum Networks. I understand this is a little bit off topic uh, in the theme of the other talks of the conference, but nonetheless, uh, I will try to give you a brief uh, flavor of what we are planning to do at IIT Tirupati. Uh, we are a new group at IIT Tirupati working on uh, quantum communication and quantum information. We are an experimental group. And uh, what I will uh, present today is an uh, 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 experimental program that we have in mind uh, regarding our lab at IIT Tirupati. So uh, the brief outline of my talk shall be the following. Uh, I will first introduce you to quantum networks. Then I will emphasize on a single photon generation. And I will briefly dwell upon the experimental techniques and then finally wrap it up with some conclusions. And if time permits, I will be happy to take some questions. Of course, the chat box is open. So please uh, feel free to get in touch with me. So uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about a futuristic information networks. So, we all know about the classical network, which is the omnipresent internet in which we are communicating right now. Uh, and uh, the information happens uh, in such a classical network uh, through bits, uh, which are coming from uh, chips and circuits. And usually the information is transmitted by strong light pulses or electronic or electrical signals. In the case of a quantum network, however, we, we will uh, uh, transmit information through the exchange of qubits. And the advantage of uh, such an uh, you know, uh, exchange is that uh, these qubits tend to exist in superposition states. And the information transmitted by uh, the network or through the network will be uh, coated through entangled single photons. So that is the key here. So in the context of quantum networks, I would uh, highlight this uh, schematic uh, for a quantum network where you have these different quantum nodes which are connected by quantum channels. So these quantum nodes are comprising of qubits and uh, the qubits may result from quantum interference between light and matter. So you can have atoms, you can have single lines, you can also have solid state qubits, right? And usually what you would like to do is you'd like to have a quantum state transfer from one node to another node. And this uh, channel that you have between the two nodes, it's supposed to be a quantum channel. It's supposed to be uh, very uh, well, uh, you know, secure in terms of communication. And the only mechanism by which we can ensure securing is entanglement. So we want to have entanglement distribution for secure exchange of information. So what means uh, what it means in the context of quantum networks to have a successful quantum network is that we need to have a solid single photon generation scheme and we also need to have entanglement. So why do we need single photons? Well, uh, quantum computing is done with single photons as the flying qubits. Uh, we want to communicate with these quantum nodes and repeaters. So single photons find their use as uh, the channel communicating from one node to another. Then you have 
quantum key distribution. And we all know that a single photon source is the gold standard for QKD. So we envision that future QKD shall involve quantum repeaters. And then through random number generation, so encryption fees, uh, keys for defense, for financial application, for gaming, gambling systems, or even for modeling complex systems require through random number generations. And these again rely on the generation of single photons. And finally, in the context of quantum metrology, for instance, uh, you might be aware of uh, the landmark LIGO project, okay, where we are trying to detect gravitational waves. Even in those uh, detectors, okay, uh, more and more emphasis is being uh, you know, uh, placed on squeezing to improve the efficiency and the detection sensitivity of the detector. Once again, in that case, you want to use single photons. So why do we need hybrid quantum networks? Well, uh, we want to... Uh, you know, evolve uh, from the classical to the quantum uh, regime. And uh, what it seems is that uh, photons seem to be the perfect information carriers. However, there is still an uncertainty on what system may be used as a quantum node. And, uh, you know, there are different groups uh, who have picked up on different uh, platforms. Uh, at IIT Tirupati, we are hoping that a coal atom and a coal ion platform would be the most suitable. So hybrid quantum networks aim at combining the strength of uh, different quantum systems. We are talking about the long coherent storage of qubits in ionic systems with rapid manipulation and electro-optical interfacing in neutral atomic systems. And the implementation of a hybrid network is to perhaps uh, generate an optimal solution in the context of quantum networks. We want to develop the best capabilities of different material systems. And in future, hopefully, we might be able to transition to an even more uh, challenging scenario where you can have a quantum dot or, for instance, an NV center interacting with a cold atom or a cold ionic system. So in our uh, experimental program, we are planning to use cold rubidium atoms and uh, a single calcium ion trapped within an optical cavity for uh, the demonstration of a quantum network. Uh, there are uh, some technical reasons why we have chosen these two species. And uh, one of the first reason is that uh, the lasers for cooling and trapping of rubidium atoms or for uh, calcium ions are easily available. Uh, the rubidium laser cooling wavelength is at 780 nanometers, which is almost half the telecom wavelength, that is at 1560. And uh, we hope that we will be able to develop this uh, transmission at the telecom wavelength. That is one key aspect of the project. So both species uh, have fluorescent signatures that are visible to standard detectors, whether it is charge coupled device cameras or whether it is photomultiplier tubes or single photon counting modules. And finally, both systems have accessible transitions for quantum computation, communication and metrology. And so if you combine all of these advantages, you would see that uh, it is a natural uh, choice that one would tend to use rubidium and calcium for this particular project. So uh, here you see this uh, rubidium energy level diagram. Rubidium has two naturally occurring isotopes. Uh, on the left-hand side is the more uh, abundant isotope of 85 RB. On the right-hand side of the figure, you have the 87 RB, which is uh, the less abundant natural isotope. We are going to plan our experiments based on the 87 RB isotope. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to build a magneto optical trap of uh, these neutral rubidium atoms, and then we want to engage uh, a four wave mixing, a nonlinear wave mixing process to generate single photons. So we will have a read and write pulse, uh, you know, uh, aimed at or through the cold atom cloud, and then we will generate time correlated uh, single photon pairs. Okay, and this is how the schematic looks like. So you have the relevant read and write photon pulse given according to the energy level diagram of rubidium. And what you can see is these two photons, these two single photons coming from either side as a, a consequence of this four wave mixing process that are being detected through the single photon detectors. And uh, you know this kind of triggers uh, the first quantum node, which is based on uh, the rubidium atoms. Now coming to the second quantum node, where we will talk about uh, the calcium ion being trapped inside uh, 
an optical cavity. So if you look at the calcium energy level diagram, okay, we have uh, you know the neutral uh, calcium uh, energy where uh, we can ionize the calcium using uh, these two lasers based on uh, photoionization. And then uh, with regards to the ionized atom, uh, the uh, calcium energy level diagram is like this. So you have the ground state, you have a couple of metastable states here, and then you have these two excited states. So usually uh, you have uh, option of uh, choosing uh, either of these uh, 4s to 4p transitions as a laser cooling transition. However, the atom or the ion usually drops to one of the metastable states and you need a repumping transition uh, to put it back into the cooling cycle. Uh, it is worth noting here that calcium ion has one additional advantage that you see this particular transition at 729 nanometers. Uh, this transition is very useful for uh, quantum uh, computing as well as for quantum metrology if you want to develop an atomic clock based on a single calcium ion. So if you uh, want to uh, develop a single photon source uh, based on uh, these calcium ion, what you would need is an optical cavity. So you trap the uh, calcium ion in this uh, radio frequency ball trap, okay? And then uh, what you would try to do is you want to ensure a strong coupling between the calcium ion and the cavity field. And what you would like to do is you would like to pump with the 397 nanometer transition, okay, continuously repumping with the 850 nanometer transition. And in uh, the right detuning, you would have a generation of 866 nanometer photons. These are on-demand single photon generation scheme. So now you can see that with this scheme, we have established the development of the second quantum node. And what remains is to ensure communication between these two distinct nodes. So in order to do that, what I show you on the screen here is uh, this particular scheme that we have in mind, which we want to implement at our lab. So you have uh, the site A, which is comprising of the cold atom node, quantum node, and site B is the cold ion quantum node. And as we mentioned earlier, that we want to ensure communication at the uh, you know, uh, the 1560 telecom wavelength. So what we have to do is we have to up convert and down convert the photons, the single photons that are generated uh, by either platform. And depending on which way we want to go, so uh, the entire scheme is reversible. So we can generate a photon at 866 and we can use that, convert to uh, the 1550 wavelength and use that to trigger the emission of photon from the cold atom mod or we can go the other way where we can generate a photon from the cold atom mode and use that photon up convert to the telecom wavelength and use it for emission of a single photon in the uh, uh, single ion in the uh, cavity channel. Of course, in future, we will have the option to add a solid state node as well. And this is the beauty of this uh, uh, schematic uh, that I have shown. So we can implement uh, a hetero uh, structure uh, in the quantum network, whereby we can add a solid state node in the near future and ensure that this hybrid uh, scheme that we are proposing uh, reaches the next level. So uh, with this, uh, I have come to the end of my talk. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you, Ajit. Thank Any you. Can questions? I ask you a question? Yes, yes, please. Yes. please. Yeah. Uh, the normal uh, non-computer system, solid state computer system, they have the high capacity because of the extremely small size of each flip-flop. That is and correct. The base are below microns from one to the next. But right. your system must be extremely large. It takes slight uh, nanoseconds to travel. How you solve these problems? Uh, so these are these right now, this is only at the proof of principle stage. And hopefully <laughs> with the advancement in technology, we will be able to miniaturize these devices uh, at a much, uh, you know, at the requisite level. That is, uh, so this is only a proof of principle concept. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, shall we go to the next speaker?
next speaker is Reinhard Dana, and he's going to talk about Zept science. And from in town, could you please stop the? Yeah, yeah, sure. And where, where's Reinhard? <laughs> could you please share the screen, Reinhard? And anyhow, from the viewpoint of no. XP, yeah, Hello, I start everybody. sharing in a second. Okay. And from the viewpoint of ICPIC, right Dana's group is the most important I group can... because, because in the last several ICPICs, he is he's, the number of poster uh, contributed papers is always the largest in the world. And without him, his contribution, ICPIC cannot survive. And today he's going to talk about the second science, but the last source is synchrotron. And that student is really, really, really a smart student. And he is a very good friend of our former student, Dehyun Yu, which Kenichi introduced. Okay, Rahat, please. Not yet? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So hi, everybody. Hi, hi, Steve, across the Atlantic. Happy birthday from Frankfurt and from the Frankfurt team. I'm really happy to be part of that Thank celebration you. event. And that's because I'm all that thankful that our passes have crossed so many years ago and continued to pass over many occasions. So and I'm happy because not only because of the signs I've learned from you, but I do admire you also for the warm-hearted, open, caring personality which you bring across to all of us and which probably is the reason why so many of to this event today. And the other facet which I would like to mention, which I do admire, that is the broad intellectual view of the state of our world, which we all like to hear from you. And I do have, as probably many of you do have, wonderful memories about discussions, not only about science with you, but discussions about everything, about history, about language, and of course, discussions about politics and social affairs. And there's, there's nothing like sharing the despair on the current state of public discourse, of course, on the current still inhabitant of the White House with you, and still acting president at the end of the scientific part, and I hope you will be interesting to learn. Your president has to do with septa second. So um, with or said, conveyed that yesterday already and I can not add too much to that and so let's move to the scientific part so septoseconds and not dipole and the people who have done the work which I'm going to present are listed on the left side and I would like to highlight in particular to Jank and Markus Schoeffler the senior people uh, in the group and Sven Grundmann and Daniel Trabert who have worked on that particular project. And the person who Kyoshi just mentioned is Sven Grundmann, the first author on the paper I'm going to talk about. And that's part of his PhD work. And this is really an outstanding PhD work. So, um, well, and not dipole, let's start with not not dipole, if you write upon not dipole or not start going to the internet and what do you find? Well, first paper you find, of course, last also a well-known person to you and you keep digging, you find another thing and you keep digging and here he is everything. You find 23 papers which Steve has authored, which have the word non-dipole only in the title 
and there are probably many, many more little deeper down in the text. So not dipole is really what Steve has contributed to the world. The same is true for, for short time measurements, which we heard, have heard from Joachim. So septo not, but seconds and other seconds. So there you don't even have to dig far back. Journal of Physics, November 28th, so two weeks ago. Again, you can do a search and you find 39 papers from Steve, which have time in the title. So as a stupid experimentalist, I feel a little embarrassed talking about time and not dipole with Steve in the audience. So anyhow, I will try anyhow. So what are the time scales we are concerned with? We all know femtoseconds, that's a long known regime. And we know that nuclei, nuclear motion in molecules proceeds on the femtosecond time scale. And the benchmark there is 15 femtoseconds to remember 15 femtoseconds is one swing of the hydrogen molecule. Then as you go to other seconds, that's where electrons do move, where you have charge ration in, and these are the typical time delays we have heard from Joachim uh, two talks ago in the other second regime. And the benchmark there is 50 other second, 50 other second is the time an electron needs to cross the hydrogen atom. Now, is there anything faster than utter seconds in AMO physics? And the answer is, yes, there is. There is, beyond electrons, there's light. And light does move on the spatial extension of atoms on the time of septoseconds. So photons, exchange of energy via photons Exchange of information via entanglement, possibly, that's still under discussion. That all is on the septosecond regime, though it's worthwhile to venture into septoseconds. And the numbers there to compare everything with is 230 septoseconds. That's the time a photon needs to travel across a hydrogen atom from one nucleus to the other. That time speed of light is 230 septoseconds. So in the septosecond regime, the question we want to answer is, if you have an orbital, could be a molecular orbital like this one, and the question is, you tickle it. You tickle it with something very fast, so with light, you emit an electron, of course, there is a weakness delay when the electron goes out. But how is this wave packet born at the onset? How is it born out of that orbital? And the question is, is that instantaneous? Is the birth of the wave process where the orbital as a whole acts instantaneously at all different positions at orbital on from where the light comes. Maybe the orbital reacts some delay on the other side of the molecule. So that's a question I want to answer. And of course, we don't answer it for big molecule, but for a toy systems or for hydrogen. And so the times we are after is it's 230 septoseconds to answer that question. Is it instantaneous, the response of the orbital or is there some intrinsic time delay? Now, how can you measure septoseconds? And we do that with very high photon energies. Eight hundred EV photons, and we eject two electrons, but for the discount, two protons fly apart and we dump 800 EV photon in, and we look only for the fast electron. The other shake of electron has only a few EV, and we 
integrate over, over that, select very slow second photoelectrons. And we look at the fast photoelectron, the photoelectron which has eaten the photon. Um, now, how do we time that? Uh, for that, we can go back to Cohen and Fano, and from them we have learned that photoionization of homonuclear diatomics, they have elaborated on N2, but it's well known for H2 as well, and many of you have worked on that, at least at high energies, and 800 EV is high for hydrogen, is really, really high. You can think of that as the outgoing electron being basically a plane wave, or in this case, the Born approximation is very valid. And in this case, you have two spherical waves starting at the two centers. And then you have two slit interference from the two spherical waves starting there. And if you look at the wave function, it will look like this. And there is constructive and destructive interference on there. And that this picture put forward by Cohen and Fano is good at 800 EV. At 800 EV, it's, it's almost exact. You can see from the data immediately, up here I've plotted in, in purple, that the measured angular distribution of this 800 EV, almost 800 EV electron. And in blue, you see the double slit. So it's, it's spot on. There is a little offset from, from background, but the distribution is exactly the double slit. And you can look at it as an angular distribution in the molecular frame if you are more used to that, but I will stick to the other representation. And there's one more support that this is really, really plane waves, our spherical waves going out, and the double slit analogon is, is almost perfect. If you look at the dependence on internuclear distance, which we can do, I mean, after the two electrons are gone, our two protons sit there and in the ground state, you have distribution of this and at the end, after the electrons are gone, with the internuclear distance from the kinetic energy with which the protons fly into our detector. So we can sort the interference pattern with respect to internuclear here. That's a kinetic energy release. So small kinetic energy release here means large slit size. High kinetic energy release means hydrogen was a little compressed at the moment when the photon hit. You can see how the interference pattern beautifully changes with slit size. This is just to support the double slit analogon is very, very good here. So in the next step now, we want to make use of that for timing, for timing this electron wave. So how would a time delay between the emergence of these two spherical waves look in the interference pattern? Well, a time delay between the wave starting at one slit and the wave starting at the other slit, you can just write down. And what it does is, I show you here, if you put a phase shift between the two slits and a double slit, you little wiggle around the central maximum. It's no longer in the center. That means that if you are, if you measure the, and you, you have a super fast stopwatch and the speed of ticking of that stopwatch is given by energy times H bar, which is the phase velocity in there. Okay, so we have this super fast. And if you look at it, a few degrees convert easily to septoseconds seconds here. So by measuring this central interference fringe you have an interferometric super fast stopwatch on septosecond resolution. So let's look what does this stopwatch show. So the figure I've shown you so far was the situation where I have selected events where the photon came perpendicular to the molecule. So thing must be by definition symmetric and you see that in the data, the central fringe is in the center at zero corresponds to to perpendicular to the molecular axis. Now we select events where the photon hit from here. So now there could be some time delay. And what we see is that indeed the central fringe seems a little bit shifted to one side. And that's a tough experiment. So you better check, have it from the other side and it shifts back. 
So the central fringe, the, the arm of our clock does indeed react to the direction from which the light hits this single molecular orbital. And to look at the full data on, on one axis, on, on one axis is the angle here. These are the three situations which I've picked before, the cosine of that angle and that's perpendicular. And you can see how this central interference fringe is not straight, which would mean zero birth time delay, but there is a tilt. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look from another perspective, that's very clearly a non-dipole effect because the electrons do care about the direction from which the photon comes. That's by definition, that's non-dipole. And you could either say what you see here is the retardation of the electromagnetic field as it travels across the molecule, would be one perspective to say. Or you could phrase it in momentum, which is just the analogy. You could say what you see here is the fingerprint of the photon momentum. Or alternatively, that's how I started it, you could talk about delay times, which is also true. And it's also different facets of the same underlying physics. So you can fit where the maximum is here and plot that angle as a function of that angle. You can plot the, the angular shift of the central interference fringe. And since we have the phase velocity, we can convert that to a time delay and you see the units that's septoseconds and the time delay is well in the range of 200 something septoseconds if you come from one or from the other side to the molecule with the, with the light and the blue line which you see here is what you would expect from the speed of light the red line is what you get if you put a little more into non-dipole than just the speed of light difference when the photon hits the two nuclei, but you add that also the atomic response of one of the atoms has also a non-dipole effect. So the, the electrons are a little forward band. If you add that, that shows up here is a little additional tilt, which looks like superluminal speed, but it, it isn't. It's just an additional twist of, of the central interference fringe and the data are somewhat in, in line with that or the error bars touch. We are not sure whether the deviation is, is real or still a remaining systematical problem. So, but with this, you can time septoseconds and you, the, the main message is there is what we call a burst time delay. And the burst time delay of the electron wave is part of the Wigner delay. The Wigner delay, of course, is more. It's all the time the particle needs to travel to the continuum. So this is the non-dipole contribution to the Wigner delay in a molecule measured directly here. Now, that's the physics perspe physicist's perspective on, on why septoseconds are so much fun, because orbitals do not react as one unit to light, but with a retardation. After we published this, we learned that there are other interesting perspectives, also one from a famous comedian who picked up on that. And I will show that that's for Steve now, because now we can show that Steve, when he picked non-dipole as one of his favorite topics long time ago, and then he switched to ultra fast timing, um, he was talking already about Donald Trump. So I can show you what um, Seth Meyer made out of that. And it's, it's kind of fun. Steve, please listen. I hope you can hear it. Scientists in Germany have announced that they've measured the shortest interval of time ever recorded. And no surprise here was how long Trump lasted on 60 Minutes. Okay, sorry, Steve, that I had to bother you at the end of this talk with your most beloved president and that picture of him in the background. And with that, well, the guy is gone. Lucky for all of us. And with that, Steve, happy birthday from the Frankfurt team. And we hope to have many, many more inspiring physics discussions with you. Thank you, Reinhard. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Finally, finally, we have science case in just second. 
which host Schmidt Becky has been talking to us as well. <laughs> Any questions? Any criticism? <laughs> Beautiful work. Yes, yes, indeed. Steve, it's off. The mic is off. Steve. It's amazing. You know, when I was a graduate student, they didn't even have nanoseconds yet. It was called millimicroseconds. Um, and I remember telling somebody this some years ago at a conference. And uh, from the other, well, from a nearby table where we were sitting, Alex Delgarno was sitting there, who was significantly older than me. And he piped in saying when he was a graduate student, the unit was seconds. That was the smallest unit that they had then. So we have moved incredibly quickly in both senses to get to from seconds to zeptoseconds in a really short time, pun intended. Actually, I have a physics question if there's time. So of course, zeptoseconds are, are getting a little more into the nuclear dynamics time scale. Have you thought, you, um, Reinhardt, about measuring time delay of photoprotons or something like that? Yeah, the answer to that, you should ask that question to Horst Schmidt Böcking. Actually, there is a paper from from Horst from I don't know from the late sixties probably where he tried to use or where they measured interferences, which you know very well from molecular X rays uh, from high energy collisions and from the phase differences. They tried to infer sticking times of nuclei, which are even faster than what we measure here, and you could do that because the wavelengths of the the interfering pathways are much shorter, so you get access to much shorter time delays, and you could reinterpret that, or at, at that time they already envisioned to use atomic interferences as ultra-fast clocks to clock molecular processes, so um, nuclear sticking times. Horst, do you want hmm. to comment on that? Yeah, this was mainly the work of Reinhold Schucht we did together at the four stage tandem in Brookhaven in the 80s. And it was the formation of the Wanner Sigma orbital in uh, sulfur chlorine collision, uh, argon collisions. And there we got a, a quantum beat. The whole duration was one other second and we got a resolution of 10 septosecond uh, with a lot of interference structure. Okay, I have not the figure here available, but uh, Joachim Burgdorfer knows this. He was at this time already working also on this field. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we go to the next speaker? The next spe speaker is Jian Wu from Shanghai. And he is pretty much influenced by Reinhard Dana's group. And Jian, are you ready? Yes, he's going to talk about ultra-fast stopwatch to clock molecular dynamics. Please, Jia. Ah, Jia, your mic is off. Okay, so now, can you hear me? Yes. And also see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So, uh, thank you for uh, for this very kind invitation from Kyoshi, and uh, also I'm very happy to be here. And uh, most happy, uh, of course, is uh, to celebrate the, the birthday to Steve. And also I'm very happy to see Reinhard Dogner and Horst Schmidt, my supervisor in Frankfurt. Yes, very good. And uh, today I will talk, uh, also talk about uh, Archifast stopwatch. But maybe I should remove the word of Archifast after the talk of Reinhard. Yeah, he already talked about the, the zip second, but for me, I still, uh, we talk about on the femtosecond, and the, 
Here, I, I will mainly talk about uh, the, the dynamics of molecules. And so I think there are many interesting phenomena uh, that happens when, when the molecule, molecule is uh, exposed to the light. For example, how the molecule absorbs the photo energy and how the electron move after the molecule absorbs the photo energy and also then the motion of the nuclear. And uh, I, uh, 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 here in Shanghai, we are mainly doing the, the measurement of this ultrafast dynamic molecules by using laser and we do the measurement in the set of co-chimps that Len had already introduced and we try to understand the, uh, some, the physical mechanics behind and uh, try to control it. And today I will mainly talk about something we did recently uh, on the ultrafast stopwatch by using a uh, polarization school, the laser pulse. As you can see here, we have this laser pulse and this laser pulse actually, it, uh, it, uh, uh, the polarization from cycle to cycle is rotate. Uh, in each cycle, it's almost linear, but it rotate cycle by cycle and it acts like a, a start and stop by measuring the emission terms of electron and the proton. And with this, we have this stopwatch and with this, we can count the time. So today I will mainly talking about uh, how to use this uh, stopwatch to clock the dissociative single and double ionization of H2. And here, this is a, kiss, uh, a scheme of the dissociative ionization of H2. And if we start from the neutral of H2 and we have ionization and then it will dissociate. And this is what we call the single ionization, dissociative single ionization process. We have different pathway. And also it may ionize the second electron and then into the double ionization. So how much time it will spend between these different steps? This is what we are, uh, we are going to talk about here. So uh, we, as, as shown here, we have different pathways. We, uh, after the ionization, H2 uh, will uh, populate on the H2 plus ground state and uh, we did this so directly, we call it direct pathway and also can absorb three photons here and then goes here and, and uh, down, uh, down, down and jump back to the ground state of H2 plus and then so that along this way, we call it near two photo pathway because it absorbs three photo, emit one photo and near two photo uh, absorbed. And also it can be go to this place and uh, uh, absorb one photo and transit to the two piece commute state and this the one photo pass. We have different pathway. For example, here we have three. And these three pathways actually can be very clearly see here if we can measure these electrons ions in constants. And this here is a uh, nuclear energy of two protons. And here is the energy uh, of one of the two electrons we measured for the double ionization process. We can clearly see we have three states, one, two, three states of structures. And this corresponding to the direct one photo and the new two photo pathways. And uh, so the first uh, we want to clock the timing for different pathways for the single ionization process. For example, we can see here. And uh, so the single ionization can happen like this. It can ionize here for start from Ti and then it dissociate and the transit here is stop here. That we call the T omega H. This is one photo pathway and how much time we will need for this pathway. And also we can have another pathway. It can start from here and it goes through here as the blue curve show here and then come down here. And this is we call the net two photo pathway and how much time we need for these two pathways. And uh, so this is a question. And uh, to, to get a very intuitive picture, we do some uh, very classical uh, simulation and we assume like uh, this, like a ball of this H2 plus nuclear wave packet and the move, uh, move on this potential curve and we simulated this is, this is a time and this internuclear distance. As you can see here uh, in the uh, red curve and so it moves gradually to, 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 to here and spends something like about 12.1 uh, frames a second. And if you look at the blue curve, so here is this, at the beginning, at uh, first stage it moves slower, but afterward it accelerates and finally, and when they move to the same place, it spends almost the same time. And so it looks like uh, they are the same, but this classical prediction, is this really or not? And we need to measure it. And to measure it, now here we ask for the help of this uh, polarization school pulse. And this is a pulse of polarization, uh, uh, pulse how is Constructed by using two components, but it's uh, orthogonal polarized and with time delay between them of delta t. And this pulse actually looks like this. And uh, so, as compared to the uh, this linear pulse, is this polarization is rotated 
from cycle to another cycle. And uh, so this is an uh, electron momentum we predicted for the linear polarization. But if we go to the circular uh, polarization school powers, and then it looks like this. We have many uh, fringes uh, in this uh, photoelectron momentum uh, distribution uh, when the electron is ionized, uh, emitted from this P, uh, polarization school the laser pulse, and uh, each fringe here corresponding to the emission of the electron from this cycle or this cycle or different cycles. And with this, we can we can use the to to time the emission time of the electron. And now we, when come to the molecule, we also have the uh, molecular orientation or axis, and this can be laid from the uh, uh, emission direction of the protons, and then this gives us a stop time. And with this start and stop, then we can measure the time, how much we spend during the ionization and the dissociation process. And uh, uh, to do that, we need to construct this uh, polarization school pulse, and uh, this is quite a straightforward way. And we send a linear pulse pulse that is 45 degree polarized, and then we uh, use a much older wave play, and uh, this converted this linear pulse pulse into two components that are orthogonal polarized, but with a time delay. And this time delay is determined by how many orders of wave play we use here. But this is not so precise, and we use another component. It's called BC. This can be used to fine tune the relative phase between this vertical and horizontal polarized components and to construct a laser pulse as we desired. And so this is what we measure experimentally. And this is the electron momentum distribution. And this is a proton distribution from the dissociative single ionization of H2. And here, first, we can identify we have this uh, inner ring and outer ring corresponding to the kinetic energy release curl of the protons plotted here. And a, this part corresponding to the one photo pathway, and this part corresponding to the net two photo pathway. And by selecting these two pathways, then we can next we can use this momentum distribution of the photoelectron to. to to clock uh, how much time it needs for the bond stretching after the first ionization step. And uh, as an example, we first uh, uh, want to show is the one photo pathway. And here, uh, this is the final distribution of the photoelectron. And uh, uh, this is the ionization property and the dissociation property, which depends on the time and uh, the molecular orientation. And this, what we want to get is this value, this uh, tau omega h. And uh, very easily, we can write these three uh, uh, probabilities into this Gaussian distribution. And then from this, we can get this formula. Actually, it's not too difficult. And uh, now, uh, as an example, for example, we select one of the orientation of the molecule, find more. And then from, from this, we, we, we know this waveform of the uh, laser field. And from this, we can calculate it. Uh, the, uh, and such a probability, and say from this we can get the TSI and the sigma SI. This is a, the, the center position and also the width of the distribution. And also in, in a similar way, by using this way, uh, laser field again, we can calculate the, the P omega D that is for the dissociation probability distribution. And then we get these two parameters. And with these two parameters, and then we have this formula here, and you can see. Now we almost know everything but this TSID. So this is something we can get from the uh, 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 momentum distribution or angular distribution of the photoelectrons. And this is the momentum distribution of the photoelectrons. And this we can plot it into the angular distribution of the photoelectron emission. And from this, and we can by, by uh, link it to the PS, the angular streaking. Uh, and then we use this map, we can convert it the uh, angular distribution of the photoelectron into the time t, and from this we can obtain this t uh, t s i d and sigma s i d, and from with these two parameters, then we can get the time. And for example, we calculate for the molecule oriented at 40 degree, and the the tau omega h is about 12.5 frame second, and when it's oriented for the 30 degree, is about uh, 30. Uh, 13.4 frame second, and actually we plot calculated for different orientation, and uh, we get the, the the mean value of about 12.8 frame second for this pathway. And similarly, we can also calculate for the uh, net two photo pathway, and uh, the, we get a value of about 12.3. And actually, these two values are very close to each other. 
And also, we, we verified by using this uh, D2, this is the isotope of H2, and also this agree well, is very well, but the time is scaled by square root of two. Okay, now we move to the second part of my talk, that is about the double annexation, and here we actually have two electrons emitted. Here is E1, and here is E2. And in most of the previous studies, that is many focus on the kinetic energy spectrum, and that gives us a lot of inf information for, about this process, but the real-time observation of this dynamics is, is really reported. And here, by using this polarization school the laser pulse again and uh, we can have two electrons emitted and the one is e, uh, emitted to this direction and that's one e emitted uh, to this direction this time delay between them and the time delay between them is in, uh, is actually encoded as emission direction of the first electron and the second electron and this is a typical um, momentum distrib distribution of the two electrons we measured by using this kind of uh, Field, laser field, and this is E1 and E2 like X shape. And from this, we get two emission angle, and from this two emission angle, and with this map, and we get a two time, TE1 and TE2, and with this, and we can get a time of delta T. And uh, as compared to a single ionization process here, actually we direct measure the emission directions of two electrons. And this, again, so this is a co-distribution of the double ionization channel, and uh, we have different peaks. We can fit and then we can select one of the energy and then with this and we look at the momentum distribution of the correlated photoelectron and with this we plot this angular distribution and we can see here we have this two peak structure and the one is the E1 and the, and that's one is the E2 and the for different channels or, or different pathways actually for different pathways and we can see that the emission angle is different and the, here we, we summarize here we summarize uh, the emission directions of these two electrons. Here's the E1. The square is the E1. As you can see, the emission direction of the first electron is mainly around 110 degree or 115 degree. But the emission uh, uh, direction of the second electron is it's in, a, in a wide range because uh, for different pathways, the uh, emission of second electron happens at a different time and that will be uh, driven by different uh, uh, polarized uh, laser field and uh, leading to different emission direction and converted the E1 and E2 into the time. And here we summarize the time we measure for different pathway and we summarize here and uh, and the, the square, red square is experimental result and this uh, diamond, blue diamond is a simulation, classic simulation and uh, we have very good agreement between the classic particular value and this experimentally measured values. Okay, after uh, we learned this interesting laser field, what can this be used for as for, uh, uh, applications? And the one thing we did recently is using this polarization school laser pulse to, to, to generate, to optimize the generation of N2 plus lacing. And uh, this is uh, something like uh, we, we, we do the strong field analysis of N2 and uh, we, we have some population on, on the excited state and also on the ground state and uh, the laser field afterward, we couple the population on the uh, ground state of N2 plus to, to the excited state of this uh, N2 plus and this will lead to the, uh, uh, the popular in inversion between the B state and X state. Actually, here you can see the ionization happens for the uh, parallel transition, but the coupling between X and A state is a perpendicular transition. It will uh, be uh, uh, optimized if we can have this kind of laser pulse, and it means at, a, at the leading edge of the laser pulse, it will cause the ionization by, for example, like this, and uh, the, the, the falling edge of the laser pulse we're calling the, uh, the coupling between this X and A state and uh, by controlling the, this waveform we, by very simply by rotating the angle of alpha and we can, can have different uh, shape of the waveform and this is very interesting can be used to, to optimize the probability of ionization and uh, the coupling and then the joint effect is uh, uh, the uh, uh, emission so N2 plus laser emission from the B state to X state. And with this, and this is the result we measured by changing the alpha, and we can have different uh, 
uh, efficiency to generate the N2 plus lacing. And of course, if we change the BC and we can change the, the uh, C phase of this field and uh, change the linear to circular, and we of course very sensitive to change the uh, efficiency of the uh, uh, N2, N2 plus lacing. Okay, uh, summary. So I think uh, here I introduced a, a stopwatch uh, or, or a, a process where laser pulse can be used as a stopwatch uh, to, to clock uh, the ultra fast uh, uh, dynamics of the uh, dissociative single and double annotation of molecules and also can be used to uh, optimize the N2 plus lacing by controlling the spatial temporal uh, waveform of this uh, polarization school pulse, which is very robust and uh, powerful. And uh, before the end of my talk, I would like to thank my colleagues uh, at East China Normal University, and also I uh, would like to give my special thanks to Langhard Dogner. And uh, so uh, he introduced me to this field uh, almost uh, almost 10 years ago, yes, 2010, I, I went to Frankfurt. Uh, and finally, I would like to say happy birthday to Professor uh, Monson, and also I would like to say Merry Christmas to uh, Happy New Year to everyone here. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. Thank you, Ji. Uh, any questions? So, uh, So, so Ravi, the question is to to Reinhardt or so uh, means chat. It's it's to both Reinhardt and Himadri. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, Ravi, I, I guess I. I just agree with you there what is magic about the magic angle it's the vanishing of p2 that's what you yeah. write and i would fully agree there is nothing particular magic about the magic angle besides that fact or right and that that refers only therefore to the d wave ah okay so i was wrong sorry yep okay i think i mean the main message from GR is that after COVID-19, we should come to Shanghai, right? Yeah, yes. Thank you. You're very welcome. OK, shall we go to the last speaker? OK, so last, I'll stop my sharing. The last speaker is, is Mikael Meyer from European XFA. And she's going to talk about the latest result from European XFA. But first, he's going to talk about how he is related to, again, the very old work of Steve. Mikael? Right. Please. You hear me? OK. Thank yes. you very much, Kiyoshi, uh, for the introduction. And also, thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, workshop. I mean, I feel really quite honored to be actively part now in the celebration of the work of Steve. And I, I think he has really made a um, very great contribution to it. And in the talk, I tried now a little bit different what you said, I mean, to, to make a link to it. And my main idea was to uh, link the first studies we did together with Steve on the laser excited uh, atoms, where we use synchronous radiation to ionize and laser excited atoms, to some more recent studies, which we do at the free electron laser, in particular there, we studied the sequential ionization of an atom and looked to the angular solution and in particular to the non-dipole uh, contribution in it. And then, of course, it's clear that you come directly along or across some work from Steve, as we already heard from in the talk from uh, Reinhardt. And then the link would be the, just what we did some other um, experiments on excited, highly excited atoms, where we inverted the scheme with the synchronous radiation before. That means we use the high photon energy to really excite an autonization state, and then we use an optical laser in order to probe the state. Okay, this is the idea. So we see how it, it will work out. Starting, starting, 
know, starting with the <clears throat> experiment on the photonization of the excited state. So one typical example here is, for example, lithium, where you can manipulate with the optical laser the outer electron, bring it from the 2s to a 2p shell. And this type of experiment, they <clears throat> have been started already in the early 80s years. I mean, there are people like Francois Villemier, Dave Edra, Jean-Marc Bijot, they started it in France. And then a little bit later, Bernd, Zimmer, Bernd Sonntag and Peter Zimmermann in Germany. And the main idea is really to look at the influence of this outer electron. You do, for example, in lithium, you come in with a <clears throat> relative high photon energy of the synchron radiation, you ionize in the 1s shell, and you see what difference you have in the ionization when the outer electron is sitting in the 2s or in this 2p shell, which you can reach in an uh, earlier uh, laser excitation. And a typical spectrum here, this is photoelectron spectrum taken at 92 eV photon energy. You see here the blue components are coming from the round state atom and the red one from the laser excited atom. And one point one can look at is, for example, the ratio. I mean, here, these two lines are coming from the, 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 the main lines. They are just coming by the ionization of the 1s electron from the 1s2, 2s ground state. So these are the main lines. And then, of course, you have in the photoionization process also the shakeup probability. And for this particular case, you find something like 20, 25% uh, probability to, to find in um, the ion in the final state in this shakeup state. When you do the same thing for the laser excited state, where now your main line is a 1s2p state, then you see that the contribution of the shakeup state has increased quite a lot. I mean, there you find already something like 60, 65% for this particular example of the 2p excited state. And then there was already quite early a theoretical calculation from Sina Pfeffli and Steve Manson showing that now when you go from the 2p to the 3p excited state, you enhance even further the shakeup probability. I mean, here re really the shakeup contribution overtakes the contribution from the main line. And this was, of course, something at that time quite new, it's quite interesting to look at. Problem was only that in order to pump from the experimental side this 3p level, you had to use at 323 nanometer. And this was really, let's say at that time, a challenge to really have a, a high intensity in the laser in order to get a sufficiently high uh, population of the laser excited state. But finally, we uh, uh, succeeded. We got this, let's say, sufficient intensity or population of the excited state. We could measure it for the 3P excited state in conversion to the 2P. So you directly see that you have here a strong uh, <clears throat> intensity in the satellite, say, really uh, overtaking the main light by a factor of four, something like this. So this verified, of course, then the theory, not only qualitatively, but also quantitatively. We had very good agreement only, I mean, compared to the 92 study, we did something 15 years later. But having then Steve on board, I mean, we went a little bit further. And we also use the polarization for these two uh, photon beams because you can now either use linear polarization or circular polarization. That means when you pump the 2p or 3p excited state, you can introduce either an alignment or an orientation, but in any way, let's say a non-statistical distribution of this M shield trap levels. And that means you get another tweak, you get another, let's say, way to control the photonization probability. And here you see, for example, in this way, or in this experiment, we just switch between left and right-handed circularly polarized slide for the optical laser. And you see that the different end stations, a uh, different final configuration change the intensity and this in a very particular form. And this goes up, this goes down. And all this was really then verified and controlled by theory. You can then, take different combination between linear and circular polarized light, combine with theory. And at the end, I mean, in some particular cases, you really have the full uh, <clears throat> explanation of the photonization process. You do what is called the complete experiment. So, okay, I mean, you can really do a lot of things with the synchron. It was really very um, nice and exciting work. 
But what you can't do, and this is now due to the fact that we had picosecond pulse duration at a CW laser in order to do the population, what you can't do is really go to some highly excited state. I mean, really exciting with the first step, some autoimmunization state, because there you have lifetimes in the order of femtoseconds. There you don't have an efficient pumping by the synchronizations. You need free electron laser light, which is intense and has femtosecond pulses. So we transferred then the scene to the free electron laser. And the first experiment we did, particularly the then was, I mean, we excited the 3D electron and krypton to the 5P resonance and looked to the resonant UJ decay. And this is what you see here. These are the 4P line, 4S photo line, and the resonant OJ lines, which show up in the region of the uh, 3D to 5P resonance at 91.2 uh, EV. And the idea was now to come with an optical laser in and probe this excited state. What we thought would happen would, there would be a shift of this resonance, and there might be also some effects on the outgoing electrons. And this is precisely what we see. I mean, first of all, when you look here at the center of the resonance, you see a shift of the line, of the resonance line, and you have here some additional lines, which are the so-called sidebands. That means the outgoing electron is also in interaction with the optical field and can absorb or emit also some photons of the optical line. But the interesting part was, of course, this, let's say, shifted um, resonance structure. And when you look there into detail on it, here the points are again the experimental data, the unperturbed and the perturbed line by the optical laser. You see that you not only have a shift, you also have a broadening of the whole um, resonance profile. And this broadening then was explained by Peter Labroklos as it comes from the fact that you not only have the field here which shift the, the resonance, it, you can also by a two photon process in this case, you can bring the outer P electron into the computer continuum. That means you have the normal OJ decay now taking place beside the resonant OJ decay. And this means you have two processes which are depopulating the resonance state. That means you have a shorter lifetime of the state. And that means you have broadening in the spectral profile of the resonance. And seeing also that here you're really now playing with the dynamics of the proteinization process, no longer for the, uh, let's say, the spectral contribution of it. And of course, we went, then went a little bit further. Also, you can add, let's say, the polarization to it. This was an experiment we did then at Fermi, where you have circularly polarized light. And we used the high intensity of the <clears throat> FEA radiation in order to do sequential ionization. So you first ionize helium, go to the helium plus ion. And then you tune the wavelength such that you do an excitation from the 1S to the 3P um, level in the helium ion. And then you can try to ionize this excited state, in this case by the four or five photon process, and then using again the circularly polarized uh, near infrared light, having the same helicity that the one from the XOV radiation or opposite helicity. And there you see already, I mean, having the same, so co rotating um, photons you end up, let's say, with one pathway more or less to the continuum. In the other way of counter-rotating, you have a little bit more complicated structures. You have different pathways. You have different outgoing waves which are interfere with each other. That means the probability to get uh, the ionization done in this multi-photon process is much higher in the co-rotating than in the counter-rotating case. And this is also precisely what we found. I mean, here we had a nice signal in the co-rotating part when we went to the counter-rotating we almost didn't see any signal at all and of course in the experiment when you don't see any signal at all you are not very happy so what we did is we increased just the intensity of the optical laser in order to bring the result out and then something else happened i mean this is the experiment i showed you before i mean this is really the almost vanishing contribution from the counter-rotating part. This is from the co-rotating. We had a very high difference. So the dichrism was close to one. And when we now increase by a factor of two the intensity of the optical laser, we found that now the counter-propagating part, this is the 
the red contribution really relative to the co-rotating increased quite a bit. And this was again, quite surprising that you have this dependency, intensity dependency on the circular uh, digrism on this, um, in this experiment, because normally you were just expecting just increase the signal from all the contributions. And the explanation for it that you have this came then from the fact that you have a polarization dependent stark effect. That means for the co-rotating part, where we really have the same helicity, you would introduce a shift to the 3T level, to the intermediate resonance we produce in the ion. That means, and this shift is so strong by the intense laser field that you really shift the resonance out of the bandwidth of the exciting FEL radiation. And in this case, you then <clears throat> reduce the population, the probability of exciting the 3T state. That means you have a relative enhancement on the counter propagating part where we don't have the shift. Okay, but this is quite, let's say, again, showing the dynamics of it and also the quite complicated situation. So we went then at the end to the simpler one where we didn't put the optical laser on it. So we looked directly to the sequential ionization process on here on argon in the 3P shell. So we ionized the 3P of argon, have the argon ion in the 3P uh, five state, ionized again and ended up in the doubly charged argon ion. And these two comp uh, compositions you can again easily distinguish in the electron spectrum having here from the neutral the ionization here from the ion and you see that you can preserve all the component. And there we looked then to the angular solution and in particular to the non-dipole effect because we wanted to see if there's any, let's say con uh, contribution or the ha happening in the sequential ionization and the basis for this was also that there was already quite early, I mean, you see 1990 uh, paper uh, from Steve showing that there should be some effects going on in particular in argon at the low photon energies which would lead to enhancement of the non-dipole effects. And this is then precisely what we did. So we measured for different photon energies, the angular distribution, we could extract the beta parameter, we could extract the non-dipole parameter, for the simple single photonization from the neutral, but also could measure, let's say, the same effect on the ion. So they have the two photon process, you also have the beta four term, but you have here really also enhancement on this non dipole effect. So the main, from the experimental point of view, the main information here was that you really could this make this type of measurement on the ion. So the ion was produced within the strong FEL pulse. You immediately created the ion and you do this type of angular distribution measurement. And of course, this position at 50 EV correspond precisely to the <coughs> Cooper minimum in the 3T ionization. So in this sense, it was at least for the one photon um, ionization, not surprising. So going out of this Cooper minimum, you have here more or less this resonant, uh, this symmetric profiles being in the Cooper minimum at 51 EV, you really have a strong non-dipole contribution. You have also changes of the beta parameters, but we could really, let's say, find good agreement between experiment and theory there. And this, of course, the explanation for this is that for in this Cooper minimum, you have the relative, the ratio between the electronic dipole and electric quadrupole contribution is there because you have a reduced dipole contribution is almost on the same, or well, you have the same ratio as what you normally have only for higher photon energies. And then for this higher photon energies, we know that we get this non-dipole contribution. Okay, so this was the link. Uh, and I hope I have made a sort of review from the very first experiments on laser excited atoms using synchrotron and optical laser then coming to the FEL where we could study some more highly excited out in the ASIN state, combining the FEL with the um, infrared laser. And at the end really had some non-dipole effects uh, combining FEL plus FEL radiation. And I don't want to um, finish without making an acknowledgement and for the first for the laser 
uh, excited uh, study on, on, on synchrotron. I think the main people there to acknowledge are Denis Kuben, François Venumier from Marseille, Peter Zimmermann, Berlin, Alexei Kronkechmayo, and of course, Steve Mansell. Then for the experiment at Flash, John Costello, Stefan Fritsch and Peter Novlopoulos, who did the calculation for us. And then of Fermi, you see there, let's say now really, the groups are getting larger and larger, and we have many people, but there I would mainly also point out, I mean, the contribution from Markus Ilch and Thomas Omarza from European Ixfell, from Fermi, Carlo Caligari, Kevin Prince, Jens Fee, Faust von Desi, Kiyoshi Ueda from Japan. And there also we had a very strong support from the theory side, Andrei Kazansky, Elena Grishlova, Nikolai Kabachnik, Alexei Grom, Kretschmeier again, uh, Nicolas Duguay, and Klaus Barchat. And this, I think, is everything I want to tell you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mikael. Sorry, you, I mean, you need more time to, to show something for, from European XFA. I'm sorry. <laughs> And so any questions or? Well, I have one comment that uh, the work on the excited states, the whole interpretation of that uh, was not originated with us. It was originated on Mikhail's essentially part of his thesis work with Bill Sandag. Uh, it was on um, uh, OJ electrons, but it gave us the idea about what went on there? We had done the calculations. We had no idea what they meant. And we saw their paper, and that gave us the idea. So what goes around comes around. Right. I mean, the, the effect is the same, no? You just, I mean, the, the reason for it is the overlap of the, of the orbitals in the ionic and the neutral state. And this exactly. you can do either when you have the resonance and the one going the resonant regime decay, or what you have calculated, the excited state, and then going to the... Uh, to the final ionic state. Exactly. I mean, this factor of four having higher intensity was at that time, I mean, for us really a challenge to, to prove it because it looked a little bit, let's say, surprising or more than surprising. Absolutely. Any, any other comment or question? Hi, Betty. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Betty is sitting next to me. So, so it looks like we have to go to the next session, right? And we are going to have a celebration section. And Furanawa, can you take it over? Take it over? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Kiyoshi. And uh, a very hearty welcome to you, Betty, to the meeting. Uh, uh, all of us uh, in the community know you very well, and uh, uh, e everybody knows you. You have traveled all over the world, and uh, I, I particularly remember your visit to IIT Mundi when you were looking for a, for a car to travel around. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it is a mountainous region, so you, you were looking for a car with a four-wheel drive. And, and Chandan, who was coordinating this, and she was trying to get you a car, and she said, every car has got four wheels. Right, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, we, we have had uh, a great uh, five sessions and I'm very grateful to all the speakers and uh, especially the session chairs uh, who maintained the schedule and there was no time delay even on a Zepto scale, I guess. Uh, everything went uh, very much according to the atomic clocks, so great sessions. Uh, we're very grateful to all the speakers. And uh, even as uh, Steve has been at the center of this meeting, I must acknowledge that the meeting itself has been put together uh, because of the very hard work and excellent work done by uh, Professor John Costello, Professor Thomas Gorsica, 
Professor Anatoly Kaifetz, Professor Alfred Mamsazani, and Professor Kiyoshi Ueda. And I will also like to mention uh, support in the background from Professor Ravi Rao and Professor Chunan Chena Chang, uh, who also helped us in various ways, including putting the picture together that you see on your screen now. And it's, it's a great picture. So uh, we are very fortunate to have these contributions from a lot of people who have helped us uh, to put the meeting together. And on behalf of the hosts, Chemost uh, and DSU, I would like to thank everybody. And the support came because of uh, continuous encouragement from the director of the IIT Tirupati, Professor Satyanarayana, the director of ISER, Professor Ganesh, who uh, Steve has certainly met, and also the vice chancellor, Professor Murthy of the Ayanan Sagar University, who I'm sure Steve will met, meet during the next uh, visit. And I hope it will be pretty soon, Steve, as soon as the pandemic will allow us to travel around. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, a lot, lot of people will have, have been wishing Steve a very happy birthday and uh, happy to join the celebrations. Uh, many others would have liked to join, and I know um, I, I don't. I'm not going to name everybody who could not be with us. But this meeting could have been larger, but some others uh, were not able to join for a variety of reasons. Um, and on behalf of everybody, uh, some participants will like to uh, speak uh, at this event. And uh, let me first invite Professor Alan Hibbert to speak to all of us uh, as part of the felicitation. So welcome, Alan. Thank you very much for joining. You need to unmute your mic, Alan. Right. Have yes. I done that? Yes. Is that, you can hear yeah. me. Yes, that's, please that's go ahead. Great. That's great. Well, first of all, thank you for asking me to come and speak. And, and thank you for to Steve to... For, for living 80 years and more, hopefully many more. Congratulations, Steve, on, on your anniversary. And I, I hope, as I say, there'll be many more. You can still hear me? Yes? Yes. yes. Good. <laughs> right. Um, my, my first links with, with Steve scientifically, I suppose, were around the end of the 90s and into the, the new century, new millennium. Um, it grew out of a... A European network which was led by Eugene Kennedy, who I think is speaking later on, uh, and then uh, on Val, Francois Willumier, and Vauquilan in Paris. Uh, and then through them, I, I met uh, Shaolin, Shaolin, or Shaolin Zhu, uh, Joe, and uh, she introduced me to Sister Steve. And we worked together uh, for a number of uh, very happy uh, trips to Atlanta. Uh, and really, it was, it was a, most enjoyable to come and, and, and do some science with Steve. I think one of the things that, first of all, impressed me was Steve's enthusiasm for science. He's hugely enthusiastic about everything he does, but particularly about, about the science and about the physics. And not only is he enthusiastic, but he's a very knowledgeable person. He's very impressively knowledgeable, knows a broad range of things, but has a focus on how to solve the particular um, theoretical problems that, that arise in the areas we were looking at, which were inner shell photoionization or photo detachment of negative ions, and also in, in the context of, of hollow atoms. So it has really been a, a great privilege for me to work with Steve over quite a number of years now. And I look forward to seeing many more collaborations with him. Uh, in the years to come. So thank you to Steve and congratulations again. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Alan. Thank Thanks. you very much. And uh, uh, Shaoling, uh, has she joined the meeting? I don't see her on my screen. Has Shaolin joined? There. Oh, there she is. Or oh, Shaolin. Shaolin, you need to unmute your mic. 
Shaolin, please unmute your mic. Shaolin? I just saw her. Uh, Shaolin, please unmute your mic. Uh, she lost the connection. No, no, she's there. Okay. She's muted. Shaolin, you're muted. And you muted and no? I, oh, oh no, yes. all right. You come in. Yeah, good. Yes, Shaolin, please go, go ahead. You're muted again. I did a muted. Now, okay, case. you're fine. Fine? Yes. yes. Okay. Anyhow, I'm here. I can see Steve. I can see Prabhu, but I don't know. Can you see me or hear me? Yes. We can hear you. We can see you. Yes. Okay. I'm happy to be here for a felicitation <laughs> to Steve Manson. And always, I also very happy to see my, you know, old friends, uh, Alan Herbert, uh, Tom Gosick, yes, which I haven't seen you guys for a long time. So yeah. here, anyhow, yes, for a Zoom meeting, that's a virtual meeting, I can see you in the screen. <laughs> okay, first, yes, happy 80th birthday to Steve. Hope you will live at least another 20 years like your mother. Uh, I know your mother, uh, I think, almost uh, uh, live uh, about 100 years old. Okay, I'm lucky to work with uh, Steve more than 20 years, I think. Uh, also, I think, yes, uh, uh, we are the first to calculate photo detachment of negative ion from inertial electrons. Actually, I very much remember we did the calculation of inertial photo detachment of lithium minus. Just after a few days, experiment result came out. But that experiment result is a very, uh, different with our calculation. So that's a big problem. Okay, finally we discuss with Tom Gorsica and understand this is a post collision recapture effect. After that, it's uh, actually, it's modified that our matrix and including that, uh, uh, you know, OCDK decay and uh, recapture process, that result show its ex <clears throat> excellent agreement with experiment. We are very happy for that. Steve Manson always told me when we finish the calculation, it is not the end. Actually, this is the beginning. I also learned a lot from Steve, not only about physics, but history, geography, and the others as well. So in this special event, it's uh, Steve's 80th birthday. I wish Steve have a happy life forever with Steve's wife, Betty, sons, and the grandchildren. Happy birthday again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaolin. So uh, let me now invite uh, Professor Horst Schmidt uh, yeah. to speak I'm to here. Us. I hope you can yes. hear me. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you, please, Horst. Please. Yeah. Uh, Steve is a theorist, we all know. But we have seen on this meeting there are probably more experimentalists attending than theorists. Because Steve was one of the few theorists, as I already said yesterday or two days ago in my talk, uh, which has a language uh, in which we experimenters, we can nicely discuss with him. It's not always possible with all theorists, but, but Steve, uh, yeah, 
uh, can feel that we, let's call us the stupid uh, uh, experimenters, that we have often very deep questions. Then without deep questions, we cannot do really uh, the real experiments which are needed. An experimentalist must have much more questions than answers. By theories, it may be different. Uh, but I see Joachim here smiling. Uh, but that's uh, what I believe. And um, I remember last time when we had a personal discussion, this was on ICPIC in um, Gans, we discussed also on the question why atoms have such insights, such a wonderful dynamics. And uh, if the atom would be just a classical system, uh, and then the electron moves so fast, it would have an internal temperature of billions of billions of degree, and it must be immediately irradiated, but it never does it. There is a wonderful order, as we all know. And this order is all dynamics. Uh, the order is coming from dynamics. And we discussed there in um, Gans that the inventor of this was a young Alfred Landé. At this time, all the big shots like Bohr or Sommerfeld, they all try to understand the atom secrets in terms of energy values. But Landé already, he was working and sitting in the same room like Max Born in Frankfurt at this time. Uh, when he tried to analyze the Seemann effect, realized that the basis in atom is dynamics and uh, it's all coming in a wonderful order from spin orbit coupling. He was the first who experienced that. The atoms form one unit, but if many electrons come together, then in the spin orbit coupling lies all the secret. And this we have to explore. We have to explore in the future much more than we have done it in the past. And okay, uh, Steve remembered that when I mentioned this a few days in the private phone call with him. Therefore, um, if you see, Steve, don't forget the stupid question of us experimentalists. But besides physics, we have also discussed a lot of politics. And I'm sure that Georgia voted now so well in favor of the Democrats. And hopefully the two senator seats are going to the Democrats. Uh, and I'm sure that Steve contributed a lot to the success in Georgia. And therefore, my congratulation to you. And I hope, Steve, that we have soon a chance anywhere in the world again to meet again on a conference. I Absolutely. would enjoy this very much. And all the best for you and your wife. I'll be there. She's sitting behind you on the TV. I hope she remembers me. Many, many years ago, maybe 30 years, I stayed in your house and I enjoyed it very much there. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Horst. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Hari Verma. And Hari as in uh, hurry up, like speed up, quicken up, not like Harry Potter. <laughs> so <laughs> this is uh, Hari. Hari will speak to us next. And uh, Hari is one of the uh, many graduate students in India who have benefited from S Steve's supervision, well over a dozen graduate students, I would think. And um, let me welcome Hari. Hari, uh, are you around? Please unmute your mic. Yeah. Hello, Hari? am I audible? Hello, am yes. I Yes, Hari. Yes, 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 okay. yes. So I am Hari without any magic band. <laughs> <laughs> so I am... <laughs> Thankful to the organizers, uh, especially Professor Deshmukh for giving this opportunity to speak a few words about Professor Manson. Uh, first of all, let me wish Professor Manson a very happy, healthy and a wonderful birthday. Thank I think you. this Amos 2020 turns out to be a grand tribute to Professor Manson uh, for his rich contribution to the field over the last 50 years or so. And I find myself uh, very fortunate to be associated with him from the very beginning of my research career when I joined uh, as a PhD student at uh, IIT Madras, uh, Chennai. So in Chennai, we were always amazed uh, with a kind of uh, 
physical insights uh, that you bring to the table when we discuss some results or data. <clears throat> and your comments and suggestions always uh, uh, added more value to our results and which subsequently led to very good uh, publications. And uh, so we are all immensely benefited from the collaborations with you. And I take this opportunity to thank, uh, on to thank you on behalf of all of us who have started uh, the research career uh, from my teacher and I. And uh, I am glad that uh, we are continuing this uh, collaborations. And uh, this year we miss you here. Uh, we planned a grand meeting in IIT Mandi, but then the COVID-19 came and uh, spoiled all the plans. But I hope uh, you will be visiting us uh, sometime soon in the nearby future. And uh, uh, yeah, somewhere I read that uh, those who perceive beauty in physics always remain young. And Professor Manson, you have that uh, wonderful ability to extract uh, beautiful physics from every data or every results that has come to your table. So I am very confident that you will continue to be young and contribute uh, significantly to the field. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Harry. Thank you very much, uh, Harry, for uh, uh, speaking at this event and our Next speaker is uh, Betty. Betty, uh, thank you for being with us and congratulations to you as well. And many happy returns of the day to you as well. So please uh, welcome Betty Manson. Betty. Thank you. Um, since I'm a really lousy public speaker, I make some notes. So I will probably read them. Um, First and foremost, I want to thank you all for allowing me to be a part of the world. Be Betty needs to come a little bit closer to the microphone, I think. Where's the microphone? Somewhere in here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Make right sure it's on. Yeah. Is it on? It's on. The yes. microphone is on. Should yeah. I start over or keep going? Yeah. yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, through Steve's involvement with atomic physics, I have met and enjoyed time with many of you although not as many as I would have liked, at conferences here in Atlanta and in many other places on six continents around the world, nothing yet in Antarctica. Married to a physicist, I often felt like physics, like a physics widow, that I took second place to physics. But over the years, I've learned that physics is not simply a profession. It is woven into your very identity, into your soul. It is, in a real sense, a large part of who you are and who Steve is. So it is not a competition. Physics and family are not competing with one another, but rather sort of perpendicular in the space of life experiences. This conference has been a revelation to me. I never realized how deeply Steve is immersed, how you all are in search for understanding of the atomic world. As an outsider, I can only stand actually sit in awe of this global enterprise. Finally, let me say how grateful and honored I am to be given the opportunity to have a glimpse into your world. Pranava, the conveners, and the speakers have done a spectacular job. Thanks to all of you. And since gravity is the soul of wit, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Betty. It, it's always nice to have you amid our group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank our, you. our next speaker uh, has got, I believe, only one publication with steam, if, <laughs> if, I'm, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so please, um, uh, please welcome Jonathan Manson. Jonathan has also um, helped me get some pictures which we have put together on the Manson moment. So thank you, Jonathan. Uh, please welcome Jonathan. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, good. perfect. Good, thanks. Hello everyone. And, and thank you for including me in this special event. It, it's truly an honor to participate. Uh, my dad's physics career has had a tremendous impact on my life. As a child, I had the opportunity to travel the world I went to France for Ick Peak in 1977, Japan for Ick Peak in 1979, 
and Israel for VUV in 1983. Uh, can I, Prano, am I able to share my screen? Sure, sure. I, okay. so, yeah. I'm going yeah. to uh, please go ahead. To share this. Can you see that? Yes, it's <laughs> so, yeah. uh, as you can oh, what see. What a lovely uh, picture! As you can see in this photo. <laughs> uh, which was taken in Kyoto in 1979. I was well integrated into the world of physics. Uh, I'm the one in the red shirt uh, sitting <laughs> in my parents. Uh, and actually Tony and Kay Starace are sitting on the other side of my dad. Mm -hmm. I'll stop sharing now. I well, it's a lovely picture. Together. Yeah, it's a nice one. Mm, beautiful. Uh, as a family, uh, oh, so, oh, sorry, uh, b before going to college, uh, I had actually been to three continents outside of North America, which was truly an amazing and unusual experience for a child at that time. As a family, we hosted a number of my dad's colleagues who visited Atlanta, and some of you are actually here today. Uh, getting to know his colleagues on a personal level was always uh, and continues to be an enjoyable and enriching experience. Even when I, I wasn't interacting with my dad's colleagues on trips or at home, I was constantly hearing about them. Again, many of you are here today. Uh, stories of new and interesting research resulting from chance interactions, snippets from funny and engaging conversations at restaurants and faraway lands, and of course, reconnaissance missions to find Coca-Cola in every corner of the world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For my entire life, my dad has talked about how much he loves physics. Uh, the subject, the people, the travel, the interactions, the learning, and the teaching. He's one of the few people I know who truly loves what he does for a living. As many of you know, he often says that he can't believe he gets paid to do this. The happy and enthusiastic way he went, and actually still goes to work every day, showed me that a career can truly be engaging and rewarding, particularly when one is immersed in a community with incredibly strong bonds like this one. I'll, I'll just close by extending a heartfelt thank you to all of you for participating in this conference and to Pranoa, John, Tom, Alfred, Anatoly, and Kiyoshi for organizing the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing that lovely picture. It really was a very nice picture. Um, Steve has uh, not only been a great author uh, of some very nice papers, many of which uh, were referred to in this conference, but Steve has also served as a referee to a large number of publications and uh, editorial boards of journals. And on behalf of the publication house, we have uh, uh, Rebecca uh, Gillen of the Institute of Physics uh, to speak to us after Jonathan. Rebecca. Uh, thank you very much um, for allowing me to be part of this. It's an honor and it's lovely to hear so much goodwill and such a close knit community. As mentioned, Professor Manson has been a long-standing author and referee for IOP Publishing's journals, um, most notably for Journal of Physics B. I've spoken to my colleagues and I know they very much enjoyed seeing you at conferences um, and hope that those times will come again soon. So I'd like to thank you a very happy birthday on behalf of IOP Publishing and thank you for all you've done to support physics and science through our journals. I'd also like to mention that we're publishing a special issue of Physical Scripta to mark this event and you are all invited to contribute an article. There's information about this on the conference homepage um, but if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me through the Physica Scripta page. Thank you very much for your time. I hope to receive submissions for you soon, from you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, our next speaker is a, a very close friend of mine, um, Professor Unil Pereira who is uh, Steve's colleague at uh, the Georgia State University. And uh, every time I visit Georgia State University, Steve, Unil, and I, we get together. We, have, uh, we talk about various things, um, notably cricket. Since Unil is from Sri Lanka, we have a common interest in that. And uh, it always surprised me how much Steve knew, knows about cricket, although it is not really played in in the US. So, O'Neill, 
please welcome Professor Onil Pereira. Onil? Yes. Uh, can you can you hear me, Pranava? Yes, Onil. Yes, Onil. Yeah. Uh, th first, uh, thanks Pranava and the organizers for inviting me. And I think this is the first time I'm seeing Jonathan. I don't know. I don't remember when I saw him last. So that's great too. And uh, again, Pranava also several years later. So Steve, it is a great pleasure for me to know you all this time since 1992 when I first came to GSQ for an interview. And I still remember uh, after maybe one or two questions about physics, we never talked anything about physics, but we talked about Sri Lanka. So from that time onwards, I realized that I can agree most 100% with most of the things you are talking to me, but maybe only 10% about Sri Lanka. So that has been <laughs> the case throughout. So the other thing is, Steve can talk about anything. And in fact, he knows more about Sri Lanka than what I know about Sri Lanka. And I usually go to him for my tax situations when my son uh, became uh, adult and he has to do in the middle of the year, he's has a separate tax form and all. So he has solutions for everything. And not only in sciences, uh, he is very, very enthusiastic and inspirational for everybody, but for everything else too. So Steve, I hope you had a very great uh, birthday and a birthday week and another great birthday and many, many more great birthdays to go to an unbeaten century, which I know what you uh, you know about that, and uh, you you remember the World Cup uh, uh, finals in India. You saw where Aravinda scored the unbeaten century. Remember? Yes, so, absolutely. So, so let, let me. Uh, I cannot talk about physics, and I think uh, not physics, atomic physics. So I think maybe I'm the only one, or maybe Betty may have uh, her name in the papers too somehow, but I'm the only one who doesn't have a paper with Steve together. So that is the only regret I have. I wish he was a semiconductor physicist. I should have talked to him as a couple of you mentioned. So Steve, again, wish you all the best with Betty and the extended family uh, including your grandkids, and hopefully you will be able to go and visit San Francisco soon. Thank you. Thanks, Yunil. Thank you very much, Yunil. Sure. Uh, it's always uh, wonderful to meet you, and uh, it's unfortunate that this had to be a virtual meeting, but I hope that we will be able to meet sometime soon. Uh, our next speaker uh, is known to the entire community very well, Professor Eugene Kennedy. Eugene? Uh, hello, you can hear and see me, I hope. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, well, greetings from Ireland. I knew of Steve Manson before I ever met him because of course he was publishing uh, many papers on photonization of ions when we were trying to develop some experimental techniques here in Dublin. Uh, and, but the first time I visited him in Atlanta for a very, very productive meeting was when we uh, co-published a paper on uh, the neon isoelectronic sequence. And subsequent to that, we also published uh, jointly on results from the advanced light source. Uh, and then a couple of years later on doubly ionized silicon. And I think we met there in France at that time, Steve, if, if, if I'm remembering rightly. Yes. So we've got about, uh, which is the great thing about physics, I think. Yeah. My last visit to Atlanta was in 2014 uh, when uh, Betty and Steve brought me to a very nice evening at Stone Mountain where we had a laser light show and music show. So he was always a, a, ter a terrific host. Mm -hmm. um, I missed out this year. Carmel and I had actually booked flights and accommodation, Steve, in your part of the world. Uh, but uh, the, the, the trip was planned for late March and I'm afraid Join the COVID club. Intervene. So hopefully soon again we'll meet in the flesh. Apart from your physics, I always enjoyed, yeah, I always enjoyed your sense of humor, and many people remarked on your enthusiasm. 
uh, during these facilitation, but also during the talks. And I think that has continued wholesale. So I, I, when I went through your Web of Science publications, you've published more papers in your 75th and 80th year than in any other year. So I think that's just fantastic to be able to keep up that momentum. Uh, Steve, I wish you and Betty and all the family all the very best for the future. Maybe you'll hit another peak in five years' time, in 85. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you will indeed. I should sign off in Gaelic uh, because one of the most surprising things that I learned about Steve and people remarked how he knew so many things about so many subjects was his knowledge of Irish folk songs. There was hardly any Irish folk song that I could <clears throat> mention where I might only know the verse, but Steve would not just know the verse, but he would know all uh, the chorus, but he'd know all the verses as well. So he always astonished me with his breadth, breadth of knowledge. Uh, so Steve, I'll sign off in Irish. You'll recognize this one, Gonairi and Borlat, which is uh, the first part of, may the road rise with you and the wind be always at your back. So <clears throat> thanks for all your collaborations over the year and best wishes for the future. Thank you, Eugene. Okay. Thank you very much, Eugene. Uh, uh, Steve would know not only the verses, but also the tune. Uh, yes, it, it, uh, <laughs> we, we, we may get him to give, him, uh, give, 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 give us one at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, our next speaker um, is uh, Professor Tunin Chang. Uh, so Tunin. Uh, uh, you, you have seen Tunin and also Ravi in the picture, Ravi Rao and Tunin were also there in the picture and they have known Steve for such a long time. So it will be so exciting to hear Tunin. Tunin? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I have known Steve for over 45 years, right? Probably even more. I don't know how long, uh, mm -hmm. but anyway, uh, just a speaker mentioned about the, uh, the uh, you know, you never publish, you only publish one paper with Steve. In fact, for somebody like myself who knows Steve for so long and uh, also interesting in the same subject, but we never publish any papers together okay, as far as I can remember. However, we do have a, some common interest. A lot of people probably know we are both Coke drinkers and uh, we always search for the Coke machine in the hotel. <laughs> and of course, I see Betty hates me. <laughs> and we're still doing that, okay, after all those years. And uh, uh, Steve is, uh, you know, we, we got together most of the time during the meeting. Afterwards, we look for restaurants, okay. The other people are Tony Starrs and the lawyer Armstrong. By the way, Steve, Lloyd said say hello because he could not join. And uh, he, talk, uh, he told me that uh, he talked with you recently and uh, about uh, what's happening. And of course, uh, the, the, we went out for a restaurant and then very soon I learned that Steve is one of the very few people I know, non-Asian, who actually can use a chopstick to pick up ice cube. Okay. That's, <laughs> that shows that he's from New York, okay? Steve is from New York and likes to eat. And that's a, and also this event actually turns out to be a testing of my memory, okay? Because this few days in the past week, I keep on thinking, what are those people? Where are those people? Now, some of the people that were still around, like Dick, uh, uh, I, I, I think I have the name, like Dick Pratt, and I met him not too long, uh, a few years back, and the share of Prosy Fishers, remember her, and she, I think, after she retired, she went to Nice to, to help. Okay. And so many of those old people, uh, you know, the name came back, and uh, in particular that uh, Steve probably knows my uh, PhD advisor, Bob Poe, Right, and uh, you know, the, in the Chinese restaurant, he came out as a, uh, you know, like like a waiter, and he brought the <laughs> chef from the kitchen, and uh, and all those, and uh, from Bapo, you remember Hugh Kelly and Phil Otic, and uh, because three of them were actually classmates uh, in, at at Berkeley, okay. 
And uh, talking about the you know, people in theory, like people like uh, Walter Johnson, Amuzia, and all those people came back to, to my memory. And also for the experimentalists, uh, I remember people like uh, 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 Bernard Christman, I, I mentioned about that. And also Francois Suedemir in France. And of course that immediately bring up the memory of Volky Lang. And, uh, and also people like uh, you mentioned about David Eater uh, from NIST, from NSF. And of course, uh, also Jim Sampson from Nebraska and all those names. And the, the younger one, uh, you know, like Dennis Lindo from, uh, Nebraska, uh, from, uh, 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 from uh, Las Vegas, okay. So a lot of people and back to the uh, old days in Chicago and we have lost the media in the Kuti, Yankee Kim, remember those people, okay. And of course, not to mention the people here, Ravi and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and also Chris Green. He is a part of us today. So a lot of those old names, and also uh, seeing the seeing the picture, we saw Joe Masick, right? And uh, from Joe Masick, me to his student, my colleague at USC, uh, Robin Shakespeare, and also immediate link to Peter Lambropoulos. Right. All those people, all those names that uh, again showing up. So, Steve, I heard somebody ask you to live for another 20 years. Boy, they don't like you. They want you to work hard. <laughs> <laughs> you are not getting out of this business. You are staying. So I'm glad to say that today that uh, I have this opportunity as probably one of the older friends than anybody else other than Debbie, uh, Debbie of course. <laughs> and, uh, you know, happy birthday. And uh, hopefully to see you again. And uh, once this uh, COVID-19 business is over. Thank you. And uh, Steve, good luck. Thank you, Tunan. Thank you very much, uh, Tunan. Um, there, there are some pictures in the photo gallery called Manson Moments at the conference website. And it has a picture in which uh, both Tunin and Steve are sitting with a uh, with a can of Coke. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we all know that both of you are great Coke lovers. Uh, so, uh, I, I'm I'm sure everybody would like to uh, hear Steve speak a few words. But before I invite you, Steve, if uh, since we are doing all right on time. Maybe just in case another one or two persons in the amongst the participants want to say anything, let me. Yes, uh, Pranava. May I? This is yes, Ravi. Yes, please, Rao. please, please, Ravi. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I'd just like to make a few comments at the end as well. First, it's been a great pleasure to see mm. on the screen Becky Manson, because I also remember very well staying at that house, and it was mm. particularly nice also to see Jonathan. I think I last saw him when he was actually younger than in the photograph that he showed. <laughs> uh, um, so that, that is the first one. The second thing I wanted to mention is Peak has been mentioned many times. Steve mentioned that his first one was the 69 MIT Peak. That was also mine, but I do want to recall the 67 Peak, which I did not go to, but Fano did, which was held in Petersburg uh, in Leningrad. And uh, I want to make a special mention because at that time there wasn't that much contact between US and Soviet era physicists, but Fano always did. And the name of Dr. Zimkina was mentioned, but I want to recall a few others, Drukaryev, Demkov, Damburg, and uh, from those times. And in fact, they all visited us. I was a graduate student in Chicago when they came to uh, Chicago as well. Uh, so those are a few more names that I wanted to recall for the community. And uh, it was also mentioned, for instance, by Tunan just now, he's had a 45 plus association with Steve. I mentioned in my talk that I first met Steve in 1966. I had just come to the US as a graduate student. And uh, Steve and John Cooper that we have already talked about, um, uh, and then some of the names that Tunan mentioned, we have also lost uh, Tony Starris, 
Mitchell Inukuti, Phil Altick, all of these uh, physicists that had a great influence on me. And finally, to Trump, uh, in a kind of Trump pun intended way, uh, what was said by Tunan, uh, for all the association and photo absorption that we have discussed, I too have never co-authored a paper with Steve. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Ravi. Can uh, I have a minute? Yes, please, uh, Alfred. Thank you, Pranab. Uh, yes, Alfred. And thanks, everybody. Uh, we have heard about Steve. But what's important from my perspective is Steve has a wonderful family. Uh, you heard Jonathan. He's, he's, I'm, I'm surprised he's a big man now. <laughs> Betty is a wonderful person. And because Betty is brave, she goes <laughs> everywhere. And Steve doesn't have to worry about anything going wrong. We, for an example, we're in South Africa, and so Patty said she was driving a, a brand new Mercedes Benz on the left hand side. She said she was worried that the torrential rains would wash out the car. In, in Jerusalem, they would say, You don't go to the Arab side. Patty would say, I'm going there. So it is this bravery on the part of the family that has been very uh, responsible for the success of Steve. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Alfred. I, I heard that a cop in Atlanta uh, <laughs> who, who ticketed Betty while driving uh, wondered if he had met her sometime earlier. And I, 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 I believe Betty was ticketed by the same cop just a week prior to that. <laughs> so anybody else? Is there anybody else who would like to make a comment? So uh, Steve, uh, let me invite you to speak to us. Well, I am more or less speechless, which is not my native state, as anybody who knows me knows. Um, this, well, first of all, from the point of view of science, this has been a most excellent conference. I have learned many things. It has given me some ideas about, well, new directions to pursue. Um, uh, and some of the ideas are old, some are new. As a matter of fact, let me share something with you. When I was a postdoc at NDS, now NIST, back in 1966 and 1967, I was working with John Cooper on doing photoionization. We knew much less about photoionization then than we do now. And we had found these uh, shape resonances in everything. And we were trying to analyze them. And John, not me, but John had the idea, maybe we should look at Felix Smith's paper because that may give us some ideas about uh, what happens here. And we did some calculations. As a matter of fact, we had to modify our programs in order to be able to, uh, to get the uh, phase shift. We didn't get the phase shift originally. It was, it was straightforward, but we had to modify it. And, um, and we did some calculations of the, uh, of the time delay to see if that would give us a, a context for talking about the resonances. But it came out in attoseconds. And we told Ugo Fano about that. And he said, ah, that was that was his comment. Nobody was going to measure anything like that. That was in 1967, so we dropped it. Uh, that was the first time I had heard about time delay. And then, uh, 40, well, almost 50 years later, it popped up again when people couldn't measure it. It's uh, it's interesting how physics goes. Um, I was put on the correct path, I think by having a postdoc with, uh, with John Cooper and Ugo Fano. Ugo always used to yell at me. Well, uh, well, yeah, yell at me. 
when I present with some results, he, he would say, you haven't thought it through in a tone more or less like that. And he was generally right. And I have used that, I've tried to be nicer, but uh, I've used that idea um, throughout my, uh, my, my physics career. When you get a result, okay, now what does it mean? What is it telling us? Um, and I owe that to Ugo Fano. He was, uh, he was a remarkable person. And I would say what success I've had was because primarily because of what he taught me, how he taught me to think about physics. As a graduate student, I learned how to do calculations. As a postdoc, I learned, I began to learn how to think about physics. And this was enormously helpful. Um, lots, lots of people can do calculations. He could really think about physics. Um, as he said about Fermi, and I said, it, and I would say about him, you know, many of us talk to electrons, but the Fermi and Fano, they talk back. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, thank you to you or to all of you for your friendship and for, how shall I put it, um, enhancing the sense of community that we really have. It's always amazing that you cannot see somebody for three or four years and then see them at a meeting and start talking as if you had seen them yesterday. That is one of the most wonderful things about our community and I really do love it. The other thing that I really love is the fact that there are no, there are no borders. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what ethnic group you're from, uh, it only matters your physics is what matters, and what's right matters. That's that's one of the things I love about science, and and I hate about um, many other pursuits like politics, where facts don't matter. Uh, that uh, there's an industry term for that. That sucks. Um, anyway, again, let me close with saying thank you to you all. I've loved it. I'm still loving it. And I'm going to continue to love it as long as I can. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, certainly uh, we will also continue to benefit from your inputs. And uh, everybody is already planning uh, another meeting 10 years from now for you. So uh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, well, absolutely. Uh, I, actually, I'm going back to 60. I'm going to start it again. Yeah, uh, fair, enough. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. We will have a replay. So, so I, I'm sure uh, this meeting, of course, uh, has been successful because of the excellent uh, technical support we got from a lot it of people in the background. It really has been amazing, and there has been there have been no glitches. So um, I'm, I'm sure um, it, it, it's something that I am really very grateful to the whole team for. And thank you all very much for joining this. Steve, again, a very happy birthday. Many, many happy thank returns you. of the day. And thank you, uh, we will, Yes. And uh, uh, we will continue to have uh, such gatherings even more so in the, in the near future. So thank you all very much. And I would, uh, although I hate to say that, it's goodbye for now, but mm -hmm. all, only with the hope that we will meet sometime very soon. Goodbye for now. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Happy Christmas. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, go. <laughs> Thank you, PCD. Thank you, PCD and your team. Yes. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Like the old English song, we'll meet again. Hey, Captain. Hey, Captain. Hey, Captain.